atheism comes from the Greek word atheos, which literally means no God. A, the prefix meaning no, and theos, which means God. So atheism is the belief that there is no God. And atheism is a lot more uh, prevalent now, or at least a lot more vocal, than it used to be. When I was an atheist in the 70s and 80s, uh, we didn't really have atheists back then. We were all secular humanists. The focus was not on denying God. The focus was on, well, um, but we had other goals. We were trying to better mankind through science and so on. Just, but my main point is atheism is indeed getting a lot more prevalent, a lot more vocal, um, and a lot of people are reading these books and wondering, well, maybe what they're saying is right. Now, there's a lot of reasons within science, though, that some of us think are good reasons to believe that there is a creator. For example, this video here was put on by, a, was made by a Harvard University showing what goes on inside of our bodies. This is showing a white blood cell rolling along one of your blood vessels. And make a long story short, once all of the various pieces are in place here, everything gets ready, it all unfolds, and then grips onto the surface of the blood vessel and makes the white blood cell stop. At that point, the white blood, white blood cell realizes, hey, there's an inflammation I need to go fight. It immediately breaks down the internal structure that you saw being built earlier so that it can then squeeze in between two other cells and go off into the tissues seeking the inflammation to fight. Now that's one small process in however many processes going on inside of that one type of cell. And again, that's only one type of cell among many. And I'm not a biologist. I'm not the one to explain fully everything that's going on there. My point is, does this look intelligently designed? I would say yes. Of course, biology is not the only science that we have to look at in terms of the origins discussion. There's also the fact of uh, how old are the various things around us? How old is the Earth, for example? A lot of people would say, well, carbon dating supports an old Earth, doesn't it? Well, actually, carbon dating is one of the favorite tools of creationists because we can point out that carbon dating actually supports a youth assessment of these objects rather than old age. Carbon-14, it turns out, is an element that decays very quickly, so quickly, in fact, that if the entire Earth were made out of carbon-14, it would all be gone in less than a million years. So if you see carbon in a sample, it means that object is far less than a million years old because there hasn't been enough time for all the carbon to disappear yet, which is why it's very interesting when you take objects that are supposed to be millions of years old, according to the conventional interpretations, but you can find carbon-14 within them, like petrified wood, for example supposed to be millions of years old, according to conventional thinking. Samples people have submitted turns out to have carbon-14 within it, which means it's only thousands of years old, not millions, because if it was more than thousands, there wouldn't be any carbon-14 left. Coal, same thing, supposed to be millions, still has carbon-14, apparently is only thousands of years old. Oil, same argument, has carbon-14 inside of it. Now, secular scientists will often answer this, uh, uh, this argument by saying, well, Apparently, somehow, your samples got contaminated with modern 14 on the way to the laboratory. Well, number one, these samples have been submitted to the, the, the best laboratories in the world, the standard ones everyone else uses, and they have long, elaborate procedures meant to eliminate contamination. You know, if our samples are getting contaminated, that means everybody else's are, too. But just to disprove that point, uh, some scientists took samples of diamonds and submitted those, and it turns out diamonds have carbon-14 deep inside them as well. And you can't say that carbon-14 somehow burrowed its way into a diamond because it's not going to do that. Diamonds are the hardest substance known. They're not, you're not going to get carbon permeating inside of it. So again, this is an argument for these things being thousands of years old, not millions. Hello. I'm Dr. Grady McMurtry in Orlando, Florida. I used to be an evolutionist. I was a trained evolutionist from birth, really. I became a creationist at the age of 28. It's been a very interesting journey, but for the last 34 years, I've been traveling the world on five continents, working in 20 languages as a teaching missionary, talking about the truths of creation versus evolution. And so uh, what I want to share with you concerns the age of the Earth, the age of the universe. The various theories of evolution declare that the Earth and the universe are billions of years old. Evolutionists say that we are just the result of a cosmic accident, that we are just thinking animals without specific design or purpose. In school, most of us were taught that life began by random chance chemical reactions. Yet when we see the beauty of the Earth, we see the complexity of the living organisms that occupy it. Can we really believe that this is all just an accident? 
throughout the world, we are presented with the evidence that calls into question evolutionary beliefs and the assumption of an old age for the Earth and the universe. Evidence that will shake the foundations of the evolutionary worldview. Evolution say that the Earth is, in fact, millions and billions of years old. Uh, first of all, you have to understand that they have no proof for this whatsoever. They simply claim it. And uh, you have to realize that evolutionists live and die by eight words. Those eight words are so important that you should memorize them. So I want you to try memorizing these words. Give me enough time and anything can happen. Those are the eight words by which evolutionists live and die. We might call it the evolutionary mantra. You see, in spite of anything and everything you can show an evolutionist that evolution is not true, they will simply respond by saying, give me enough time and anything can happen. So the question must be, has there ever been enough time? Now, I was once asked to write an article for a publication. When you're asked to write articles for publications, sometimes they give you the title of the article and say, we want you to write it. Uh, sometimes they say, pick your own title and write the article. And I was given the title. The title was to be, how do you date a rock? And my first response was, first you have to ask her. Well, some of you got it anyway. So, I mean, let's think about this. Is there anything about a rock that will tell you how old it is? Is there anything about the size, feel, shape, smell, taste, weight, mass, specific gravity, density, chemical composition? Is there anything about a rock that will tell you how old it is? And of course, the answer is no. There's absolutely nothing about a rock that will tell you how old it is. As a matter of fact, I can go outside right now, pick up any rock I choose to. I can claim any age I want to for it. You may disagree with me, but you cannot prove me scientifically incorrect. You understand, I can go outside right now, pick any rock I want to, claim any age I want to for it. You may disagree with me, but you cannot scientifically prove that I'm wrong. I mean, think with me, when you go outside and pick up rocks, do they come with little white strings attached, little white tags saying I'm 10 million years old and signed by a scientist who was there at the time? Excuse me? No. So let's think about this. Is there any way in which you can date a rock? The answer is no. There's no way that you can date a rock. And so what we want to talk about is, are the Earth and the universe really billions of years old, or are they, in fact, young? Now people will say, well, you know, the Earth is old. It, was, it all came from a big bang. Supposedly this big bang occurred some perhaps 20 billion, supposed years ago. But is the Earth and the universe really 20 billion years old, or can you really trust the Bible to tell you the truth that it was created just 6,000 years ago? Now, I, you know, you say a young Earth, young universe, and people will say, but wait, but wait, doesn't it have to be old because, and they will say things like, doesn't it take millions of years for rocks to form or for diamonds to form? What about stalactites and stalactites to form? What about polar ice caps to form? What about thousands of feet of rock layers to form? I mean, doesn't that take millions and billions of years? Or what about deep canyons to be cut into rock layers? What about dinosaur fossils to form? Doesn't that take millions of years? Or perhaps they say coal. Doesn't it take millions of years for coal to form? Or wood to fossilize? And the big one always is, doesn't it take millions and billions of years for light to reach us from distant stars? I mean, that's the big one that everybody asks. But I say it all has to be young. I say it all has to be young because. Now, I always like to start with something for the ladies. Now, ladies, this is a piece of opal mineral rock. This is dug by hand from Australia. And uh, that's a nice stone, right? Oh, come on, ladies, that's a nice rock, right? Now, that's a piece of natural opal from Australia. This is a piece of man-made opal from Australia. Under an electron scanning microscope, you can't tell the difference. But this artificial man-made opal was grown in that jar right there. Have I got your attention? You see, this is a natural piece of opal stone mined in Australia by hand. We want to take a look at, does it take millions of years for gemstones like opals and diamonds to form? And what about gold to form? Well, this is a natural piece of opal. This is a man-made piece of opal. It was grown in this jar right here. You can actually see it growing right there in that lens. And it only took 
three months. Have I got your attention? You put the right chemicals in a jar, stick it up on a shelf, and it can grow an opal in three months. I want to assure everybody here, if you have opal jewelry, it's real. This gentleman is a Christian, a creation-believing scientist. He only does this as a laboratory experiment, but he's found out how to do it. But he doesn't sell them. He doesn't put them on the market. He doesn't flood the market with these things. But it only takes three months to get an opal. Or how about that rock right there? Come on, ladies, that's a nice rock. Ah, oh, come on, that's the Hope Diamond in the Smithsonian. That's a nice rock, right? But evolution said it takes millions of years to form diamonds. Well, first of all, though, you really know that that's not true because if you think about it, you know that we've been able to make industrial grade diamonds for many, many years. It takes a few months. We simply subject carbon to heat, pressure, and so forth. And, but these are crude diamonds in the sense that they're not gem quality diamonds. They are diamonds, but they're only used for abrasives and grinding and so forth. But are you aware? that in 2003 we found out how to make pure, super hard diamonds in only a matter of minutes. Now it takes high pressure and high temperatures, but it only takes a matter of minutes to get gem quality pure diamonds. Are you impressed? Well, think with me for a moment. You, you know how scientists are. If we learn how to do something, well then the next question for a scientist is how do you do it faster or cheaper or both, right? So the very next year, we found out how to do it at much lower temperatures, much lower pressures, and it only takes 12 hours. Is this interesting? Oh. Well, but you know how it is with scientists. If you learn how to do something, the next question is, how do you do it cheaper or faster or both, right? Well, in 2006, we found out how to make flawless, pure diamonds, up to 10 carats. It only takes one day. Today in the United States, you can go into a jewelry store, you can buy a diamond, you can either pay for a natural diamond or you can get a man-made diamond. They're of equal quality. And the man-made diamond's cheaper. And you now have a choice. And uh, let's think about this. We now know that kimberlites, which are what you find diamonds in, actually come up from deep inside the earth at about nine miles an hour. It only takes about 12 to 30 hours for this material to come to the surface of the earth. We found that out in 2000. And uh, this is another report, 1999, showing that again, it only takes about two to eight hours for these materials to come to the surface of the earth. So I guess it really doesn't take millions of years to get a diamond, is that correct? Have I got your attention? Well, what about gold? I mean, doesn't it take a long time for gold to form in nature? Well, actually, no. The massive Lahur gold deposits in Papua New Guinea could have formed in, quote, as short as five hours, unquote, claims geologist Greg Hall. That's January of 2007. Here, in a report that actually goes back uh, to uh, 1985, uh, water sampled from over half a mile down by these geochemists contained, quote, thousand times the highest concentration of gold ever recorded in the surface waters of hydrothermal systems, unquote. Uh, but this was found at a geothermal power plant in New Zealand back in 1985. Today, we now think that there's approximately 53 pounds of gold being deposited in this gold mine while it's being mined. Well, 53 pounds of gold is no shabby, right? And what about stalactites, stalagmites? I mean, doesn't that take millions and millions of years to form? I mean, think with me for a moment. When you go to places, the caves, and limestone caves that have stalactites, stalagmites, don't they say to you, oh, it takes 10, 20 million years to get a cave like this. Is that right? And the other thing they say is, don't touch that. Right? Come on, they say, don't touch that. It'll take a thousand years to grow back, right? Well, I'd like to see if it really does take 10, 20 million years to get a limestone cave like this. I'd, I'd like to see if you touch it, does it really take a thousand years to grow back? Now, we're looking at do stalactites and stalagmites form slowly or fast. Now, this is a photograph of some Mayan pottery made in the Americas. Uh, we know it was made about 700 AD. Um, 
But in this photograph, you'll notice right here, this is a stalagmite coming up from on top of the pottery. Is that correct? So uh, let's think. Here's this stalagmite on top of the pottery, so that means it formed in less than 1,300 years. Is that right? So if it only takes 1,300 years for this stalagmite to form, I really don't think it takes 10, 20 million years, do you? Not really. There you go. Or how about this? Now this comes from Australia. This is a man-made tunnel. We might call it a man-made cave. It was dug 160 feet deep into a basaltic or a volcanic hill in Australia in 1857. But here you see this beautiful flow stone. Here you see these stalactites coming from the ceiling. Now let's think. This photograph was taken in 1997, so it only took 140 years for these formations to form. So I don't really think it takes 10, 20 million years to get a limestone cave. How about you? Oh, come on, can y'all say, not a chance? A little louder. Not a chance. Very good. And uh, evolutionists will tell you, well, the polar ice caps contain perhaps a quarter uh, million years of accumulated ice and snow and so forth. As a matter of fact, they will tell you that you can see the little lines in the polar ice caps. They'll say, you, oh, you can see 200, 220,000 lines there and so forth. Uh, first of all, that's not true. It's actually a lie. I want you to think with me for just a moment. How many of you have opened up a refrigerator freezer door and you've seen two ice cubes flowing together in the middle of the freezer? Is that right? Oh. Now, it is true that you can see these little lines near the surface at the top and even down into the middle, but once you get down in the middle, the pressure of the ice is so great that those lines simply become invisible, and after that it's just you know subjective judgment and so forth. And they'll tell you that these little lines in the polar ice caps, those are just like annual rings in a tree. You know, you cut down a tree, you count the rings, you know. And they say, oh, well, you can see 200, 220,000 lines. They're just like tree rings and so forth. So this tells us that the polar ice caps are 220,000, you know, years old. But I don't think so. I mean, when I was an evolutionist, I used to accept that kind of thing, but I don't believe it anymore. Let me show you why. Now this is a Boeing B-17 medium range bomber from World War II. This is a Lockheed P-38 fighter from World War II. In 1942, two bombers escorted by six fighter planes left the United States to go to England as a part of the war effort in World War II. Now these planes cannot fly directly across the Atlantic. They don't have nearly enough fuel. And so what they must do is they have to fly first to Bangor, Maine. From Bangor, Maine, they fly to Newfoundland. From Newfoundland, they fly to Greenland. From Greenland, on to Iceland, and on down to England. Now, these eight planes took off from the U.S. in 1942. They got to Greenland, and they fueled up on the west coast of Greenland. They started across the polar ice cap of Greenland, ran right smack into a snowstorm. This was a complete whiteout. They couldn't go forward. They tried to turn around, find the base they came from, couldn't find the base they came from. They decided they were going to have to crash land on top of the polar ice cap. Now the first plane went in with its wheels down, flipped over. Everybody said that's a bad idea. So the other seven planes came in with the wheels up and just belly landed. Now after the storm was over, the crews were rescued, but the planes were left there because it was much cheaper, much faster to just build new planes back in 1942. But in 1988, some enterprising American men remembered that those planes were up there, and there's a lot of money in antique aircraft, especially military, and so they decided to go up and get these planes, you know, rehabilitate them and so forth, make some money. And so they took brooms and shovels up there to find these planes. Now you have to understand, these planes are not heavy enough to sink into the ice. Wherever they landed is where they stayed, okay? So they crash landed in 1942. Planes stay exactly where they landed. Um, well, it's only been 46 years. Anybody want to guess, tell me how many inches, or if you prefer feet, of ice and snow they found on top? Anybody? I mean, it's only been 46 years. How much ice and snow do you think they found? 20 feet. Thank you. I have an opening bid of 20. Do I have another bid? 10. Okay, we have a bid of 10 feet, 20 feet. I'll take one more bid. 50 feet. Oh, my goodness. Well, I have to stop the bidding because all of you are just a little low. You see, what we actually found was 250. In 46 years, 250 feet of ice and snow had formed on top of the plains. This is a picture of Glacier Girl as she looked when found 250 feet below the surface. 
they had to come back. They couldn't find the planes. They took back the brooms and shovels, came back with sonar and radar that would penetrate the ice, finally found the planes, 250 to 270 feet below the surface. They actually had to come back with heavy equipment, bore these big holes all the way down, 250 feet. They've actually disassembled her, brought her back up in pieces, reassembled her. She's one of the few flying P-38s in the world today. So let's think. It only took 46 years for 250 feet of ice and snow to a pile up on top. That's 5.4 foot per year. Is that correct? I don't think those little lines in the polar ice caps are annual rings. I don't think those are years. I think those little lines are individual storms. That would be much more reasonable, wouldn't it? Oh. Now this is a picture of the upper Grand Canyon of Arizona. And here you see hundreds and hundreds of layers of rock, right? I mean, you know, it's a beautiful area. Now, evolutionists would tell you that these layers could span millions and millions, even hundreds of millions of years, but I would like to get to think about it something for just a second. First of all, all those layers you see here are sedimentary rock. Now, what is sedimentary rock? Well, it comes from the word sediment, correct? So if I had a glass of water here and I threw dirt and sand into the water, whatever settles to the bottom would be called sediment, correct? So sedimentary rock is a water deposit rock. You remember from school, there's only three kinds of rock, igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary. All these layers of rock you see here are sedimentary rock. What you really see here are just layers of dried out mud. That's everything you see here. These are just layers of dried out mud. And I say it takes just one year to cut that canyon. That these are just the wet mud layers laid down by the flood of Noah, that this whole canyon was cut in just one year. Now, of course, you could argue with that. But let's just take a look at it. This is a picture of the south wall of the Grand Canyon taken at sunrise from several miles away. This is the Colorado River. Now, when you see these layers, you see hundreds and hundreds of layers here. Is that correct? But they're all layers of dried out mud. Now, if you were to believe that all these layers came from individual floods, you would have to believe that about a thousand floods of roughly equal depth occurred one after the other exactly the same way, covering hundreds of thousands of square miles. Now, does that even seem acceptable? That's a little tough, right? And I would like you to think about something with me for a minute. A good scientist always asks two questions. The first question is, what's there? Meaning, when I make a scientific uh, observation, I have to adequately and accurately describe what is present, what is there. But the second and more important question in science is, what is not there? You often learn more by asking the second question than the first. Now, let's ask ourselves the two most important questions in science concerning the Grand Canyon here. What is there? Well, we have hundreds and hundreds of layers of dried out mud. Now, think with me for a second. If each of those layers was laid down by an individual flood, then there would have to be some time for each layer to be exposed before the next layer was deposited on top, correct? Right, if it's one at a time, you know, one layer, then there's a time of exposure, then a second layer, a time of exposure, then a third layer, right? Now, if that were true, if each of these layers here that seem flat, although they're not flat, they actually undulate and they twist and turn and meet each other at a 90 degree angle, and if you go to the north side of the canyon, and you go up the North Kaibab Trail, there's a place where you can actually see one kind of sedimentary rock completely surrounded by another kind, like a donut, but the donut is surrounded by the kind of dried out mud that's in the middle. Hmm. Well, if each of these layers is supposed to represent different ages, that each one was laid down, there was a period of time of exposure between the next layer being laid on top, then please tell me, please tell me, why are there no soil horizons between the rock layers? I mean, if the rock layers have been exposed, we would expect some weathering. We would expect some of the rock to turn into soil. Is that correct? But there's no soil horizons between the layers. Why are there no V-shaped erosion marks in the layers? I mean, think with me for a minute. If you have a layer deposited, rain falls, starts to etch a V-shaped erosion mark into the layer, then the next layer comes in, is going to fill that in, it's going to preserve it. Is that correct? But there are no V-shaped erosion marks in these layers. There are no animal holes. There are no root holes. That's all missing. So what does that tell you? It tells you that all of those layers of dried out mud occurred in one year by a big flood called the Flood of Noah. 
and because there's no soil horizons, V-shaped erosion marks, animal holes or root holes in the layers, it proves they were all deposited at one time. Now, there are evolutionists who rely heavily upon radiometric dating processes to determine the age of a rock. Now, understand, anytime I use a big word, I always wanted to define what it means. What does the word radiometric mean? Well, it means the use of radioactive materials to supposedly measure the amount of time since an event has occurred or a creature lived. You've all heard of carbon-14. Maybe you've heard of uranium lead, potassium argon, rubidium strontium. There's all kinds of these, but carbon-14, potassium argon, rubidium strontium, uranium lead, those are the ones that most people know of. Actually, there's over 80 of them. And they say that you can date a rock, you know, millions, billions of years old using these radiometric dating processes. However, that's not true. First of all, none of them work. Not one of them works. Carbon-14 doesn't work. Even the man who invented it, Dr. Libby, admitted it didn't work. But none of them work. First of all, none of them work because they all start with five false assumptions, and carbon-14 has seven false assumptions. Now, would you agree with me that if you have a dating technique based on five false assumptions or seven false assumptions, then you're not going to be able to get a reliable date. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, that's right. You also have to remember that in the case of carbon-14, that the flood of Noah would drastically change the carbon cycle, so that really throws it off. And then would you agree with me on something? If these things actually worked, you know, if they did, and you could use two different methods on the same rock, uh, wouldn't you expect them to be approximately the same date? You know, uh, you know, about the same age and so forth. Is that right? I mean, agreed? If you could use two different ones on the same rock, if they worked, they should be about the same, right? Okay. Uh, how about if I was within 10%? Would that be satisfactory? I'm willing to negotiate. What do you want, 15%? Tens, okay, well, I got tens enough, okay. Well, good. Well, here's the problem, you see. Not only do these methods not work, there are major contradictions between different dating methods used on the same rock. For example, this is Sunset Crater National Monument. It is south and east of the Grand Canyon in Arizona. It's a relatively small volcano, beautiful though. It gets the name Sunset because the cinders at the top just glow at sunset. Now, anybody who knows anything about Arizona, New Mexico, that part of the United States would know that there's a large number of Indian ruins in this area. As a matter of fact, there are Indian ruins right in the park area. And so let's think. We know that this eruption can be dated at about 900 years ago. We can do that by tree ring counties because 900 is not a big deal. And we know that there were Native American Indians living in the area. First of all, their remains of uh, their houses and so forth are there. And also, in the cinder cones, in the lava flows, from this eruption, we found Native Indian artifacts. So we know that there were people living there at the time that the eruption occurred. And some of their artifacts were trapped in the material from this eruption. So, there were Native Indian artifacts found in the lava flows and cinder cones. Now, this is volcanic rock. Now, when it comes to volcanic rock, the method of choice here would be the potassium argon method of dating. And so uh, we potassium argon dated some of this material, and the laboratory that did the work came up with a date of 210 to 230,000 years old. I think that's more than 10%. Am I right here? Oh. Or what about this rock? This comes from Australia. This is a piece of volcanic rock from an eruption in Australia. Inside the rock, when we cut it open, we found this burned wood. It's really charcoal. Um, so let's think. This volcano erupted. The rock completely surrounded a piece of wood. There's no question there's no contamination here. The rock completely sealed the wood inside. Now, the heat of the lava caused the wood to burn. And so we were left with basically charcoal inside the rock and lava rock on the outside. Now, of course, since this is charcoal, you would use the carbon-14 dating technique. And the rock is volcanic, so you would use the potassium argon technique. Now, understand, please, I don't agree with these dates. You do understand that. I believe the Earth and the universe are 6,000 years old. However, the laboratories that did the dates got for the carbon-14 date on this wood an age of 45,000 years old. Now again, I don't agree with it, but that's what they got. 
The lab that did the potassium argon date on the piece of lava got a date of uh, 37 million. I think I see a problem here. I think that's more than 10%. Am I right here? Oh. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I am particularly, uh, I'm particularly proud of this particular one, so I want you to take careful attention. Let's go back to your 1801, Hu'alili, Hawaii, on the big island of Hawaii. Uh, now, you know the Hawaiian Islands are just volcanoes that stick out of the water, right? So I want you to think about this. So the, the volcanoes of the Hawaiian Islands are just coming up from the ocean floor, sticking out of the water here, 2.6 miles and higher here. Um, but here are these volcanoes in the Hawaiian Islands. Now, in 1801, there was an eruption of one of these volcanoes, and the lava flowed from the top of the mountain, down the side of the mountain, into the ocean water, went all the way down the side of the volcano, all the way down to the ocean floor, 2.6 miles down. Okay? Now, people were there to see this eruption occur in 1801. Now, I'm, I'm kind of proud of this, so I want you all to pay close attention to this. Okay? Are, are you ready? Come on, are you ready? Okay. In 1801, there was an eruption. You missed it, didn't you? Come on, I'll show it to you one more time. Okay. In 1801, there was an eruption. Now, you're all supposed to say, ooh. See, I'll show you one more time. See, in 1801, there was an eruption. Ooh. There you go. Well, we've got the bright idea. Let's send a robot down and test this lava flow for the age using the potassium argon method. So we sent a robot down. It went down eight-tenths of a mile, got a zero million years old. Now, first of all, that is correct, because think with me for a second. It was only 200-year-old material. Potassium argon is not good on hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands. It's only good on millions. And so if this material is only 200 years old, then zero million is correct. Everybody with me here? We got the bright idea, though. Let's take the robot. Let's go down two miles. Took a sample. Got a potassium argon date of uh, 12 million years. I said, well, that's interesting. Let's send the robot all the way down to the ocean floor, 2.6 miles down. Took a sample. Got a potassium argon date of uh, 21 million. I think I see a problem here. How about you? These methods do not work. None of them work. They all start with five false assumptions or seven false assumptions, and none of them work. Well, let's go on. This is my favorite kind of fossil. Now, my favorite kind of fossil is called a polystrate fossil. Now, again, when I use a big word, I always like to explain what it means. All of you would know the word poly means many, correct? Now, straight, strat, stratum, this all refers to layers. And so a polystrate fossil is any fossil which penetrates through two or more layers of the fossil record. Now, they are usually tree trunks, but they're often bone. But any fossil that penetrates through two or more layers of the fossil record, they are usually tree trunks, but they are often bone. Now, here you see in this photograph from Australia, many, many layers. Is that correct? Everybody see the polystrate tree trunk? Well, if you can't, it's right there. But what's particularly interesting about it is this. First of all, it's not petrified, it's coalified. This is a tree trunk turned to coal, but you'll notice it has no roots and no tops. It's just a log, is that correct? Kind of tells you it didn't grow there, doesn't it? Well, let's think about this. How did coal form anyway? I mean, how many of you remember being taught in school the old swamp theory of coal formation? They used to teach us in school back, you know, when I was in grade school, they used to say, oh, you know, there were forests and swamps covering the earth 300, 360 million, suppose, years ago at the time of the Carboniferous period, that these trees grew up in these swamps and they fell over and died, you know, and they built up in the water of the swamp. And because there's so little oxygen in the swamp, water the trees piled up one on top of the other. And that's how we got coal. Does that sound at all familiar? But nobody teaches that anymore, at least not any honest evolutionist, because they all know it's not true. You see, first of all, let's take a little look. Here, you see some small coal layers or coal seams, is that correct? But first of all, think with me. Do you notice it's flat on the bottom and flat on the top, is that correct? So, first of all, does anybody here see roots coming down from below these layers? No roots. It's flat on the top, flat on the bottom. 
Number two, you only find natural gas, coal, and natural oil between layers of sedimentary rock. Now what is sedimentary rock? That's layers of dried out mud, is that correct? So you only find natural gas, natural coal, natural oil between layers of dried out mud, or some kind of sandstone. But there's something else here too. Notice right here, see how this coal seam forks right here? At the fork right there? Well, once they started realizing that, they started realizing the swamp theory simply wasn't true and they stopped teaching it altogether. Now this is a pure layer of anthracite coal. Now anthracite coal is the hardest, densest, blackest, bestest coal there is. Anthracite coal is the really good stuff. Now this comes from our state of Michigan, but uh, this is about a foot and a half to two foot thick layer of pure anthracite coal, the really good stuff. Now let's think. To get anthracite coal, you have to have 10 foot thick layer of plant and wood deposits compressed down to 10 to 1. Okay, so it takes 10 feet of material compressed to 1 foot to get hard anthracite coal. Now if you take 10 feet and you compress it maybe 3 to 1, you get soft coals like lignites, and 5 to 1, you know, you'll get soft coal, and maybe down 5, 7 to 1, you'll get bituminous coals and so forth, but it takes 10 to 1 compression ratio to get anthracite coal. However, in our state of Utah, we have a pure layer of anthracite coal 200 foot thick. Now that tells you there had to be a layer of logs and vegetable material 2,000 foot thick there at some time in the past to be compressed down to 200, is that correct? I would suggest you only a worldwide flood could do that. A layer of logs and wood 2,000 foot thick all in one place all at one time would require a worldwide flood. And this is a bell found in 1944 in medium grade coal in our state of West Virginia, but the coal is supposedly 300 million years old. Oh, it's a very unique alloy and has a iron clapper on it and so forth, but this is a pre-flood bell used between creation 6,000 years ago and the flood of Noah by somebody and trapped in the coal from the flood. And uh, doesn't it take millions of years for fossils to form? I mean, you know, I grew up on the campus at the University of California, Berkeley. Now I did that because my father was a student at Berkeley. He got his degrees at Berkeley. He went on to become a professor at Berkeley, at one time a secretary to the president. And I actually grew up on the campus of the University of California, Berkeley. Now that's the bad news. Here's the good news. The good news is that when I was not in the California public school system learning evolution in elementary school, well, I was in the paleontology laboratories at the University of California, Berkeley, learning about dinosaurs, fossils, and evolutionary theory from PhDs when I was just in elementary school. I learned about this so well that by the time I hit the third and fourth grade, they used to borrow me from one class to the other, and I used to teach the other children about fossils, dinosaurs, and evolutionary theory because I knew more about it than the teachers did. That's an absolutely true story. Now they taught me back in those days at Berkeley that it takes millions and millions of years to get fossils. They told me that dinosaurs, you know, been dead for 65 to 70, up to 150 million supposed years. But I don't believe that anymore. I don't. Now here's why. They say it takes millions and millions of years for fossil form. Is that correct? Right? Well, let me show you a fossil. Uh, this is kind of an interesting fossil. It's called a Teddybarosaurus. Now this Teddybarosaurus fossilized, it only took four months. This was formed along the Thames River in England. There's a place where they have this overhang and a walkway underneath and it's limestone rock and there's water that comes over the limestone rock along the Thames River there and people actually walk along underneath and they tie tennis shoes and teddy bears and other things, Coca-Cola bottles, you know, on long strings, and they come back and four months later they have a fossil. You're not impressed? Well, how about this fossil? Uh, this is a coil of man-made rope, uh, but this fossilized in only two weeks. Are you impressed? Well, if you're not impressed yet, how about this? I think you'll agree, that is a fossilized fish, is that correct? 
But this fossil fish is quite interesting. You see, according to the evolutionists who found it, it died and was fossilized in less than five hours. Oh yeah. You see, this comes from Brazil, the Santana Formation, which was reported in 1989. But we found fossil fish with fossil gills, fossil muscles, fossil stomachs. The evolutionist paleontologist who found it did not allow his theory to get in the way of a good scientific observation. I, I applaud him for that. I really do. I, I, I really do. And he said this, quote, what is clear is that the fossilization process took place moments after the fish died and was completed within only a few, probably less than five hours, unquote. But he went on to say this, in this case, quote, instantaneous fossilization, unquote, is suspected to have been the very cause of death. Did you get that? D-O-A, fossil. This evolutionist paleontologist was making a valid scientific observation. I do applaud him for this. He was being honest. He didn't let his theory get in the way of his, you know, observation. And he made a good scientific observation. What he said was, based upon what he found, the cause of death might well have been the fossilization. So I guess it doesn't take millions of years to get a fossil. Is that right? Oh. And then we have helium missing from the Earth's atmosphere. Helium is made in the crust of the Earth by the decay of radioactive material. It's the only way helium is basically made on Earth. Now, let's think about this. It's produced by the decay of radioactive materials like uranium in the crust of the Earth. Now, when that helium is made in the crust of the Earth by the decay of radioactive materials, it leaks out through the rock because it's an inert gas. It won't combine with anything else. It leaks out of the rock and into the atmosphere. Now, it is not lost into outer space. As a matter of fact, we actually get a slight addition of helium to the Earth's atmosphere by cosmic winds, but it's not lost into space. So whatever helium has been made on Earth is still basically here. Uh, the problem is this. Though it escapes in the atmosphere and stays here, there's only enough for the atmosphere to be less than 2 million years old. Now, I would find it problematic to have an Earth that was 4.6 billion years old, but an atmosphere that was less than 2 million. How about you? And uh, here, there's too much salt in the Dead Sea. Now, here's a satellite photograph of Israel. Here's the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, the Dead Sea here. But the Dead Sea has too much salt in it for it to be old. The north end today is 31% salt, the south end 37% salt. This is why you can't drown in it unless you strap on about 500 pounds of lead weights. But think with me for just a moment. All this salt would actually accumulate in less than uh, 13,000 years. But evolutionists will tell you that the Jordan River Valley, this volcanic rift valley that we have here, they will say it is anything from 5 to 10 up to 20 million years old. But think with me for just a second. If, in fact, the Dead Sea were, and the Jordan River Valley were, 5, 10, 20 million years old, well, that means that the Jordan River flowing into the Dead Sea would have to be cleaner than distilled water for 20 million years. Anybody here ever seen the Jordan River? It's not that clean, right? So this is what we call a regional geochronometer but it simply shows that this is not 5, 10, 20 million years old. It's less than 13,000 and totally acceptable with only 6,000 or, in fact, 4,500, which is from the time of Noah's flood. I'm sure you've also all noticed that the moon is moving away, right? You all had noticed the moon is moving away, right? Where are your powers of observation, people? The moon is moving away from the Earth at a staggeringly fast rate. Come on, are you all ready to be staggered? Come on, are you all ready to be staggered? Well, the moon is moving away at a staggeringly fast rate. It's moving away at two inches a year. Come on, two inches a year. Aren't you staggered? You're not? Well, you should be. Think with me for just a second. Today, you don't have to believe me. Today, you can prove this in a laptop computer, desktop computer at home or the office. The moon is moving away at two inches per year. Now, do any of you remember something called the law of gravity? Come on, you all do remember something called the law of gravity, right? And the law of gravity says basically that as two objects get closer together, there's a stronger and stronger pull together, is that right? 
Now it's an inverse square law. You half the distance, you quadruple the force, and so forth. But you plug the formula into a laptop computer today, and you can prove to yourself, think with me, if the moon is moving away at two inches per year now, well, if I go back one year, it would be two inches closer, correct? Another year would be two inches closer. But as the moon starts to come back towards the Earth, well, then the force of gravity starts to increase. Is that correct? And the rate at which the moon comes back gets faster and faster, correct? Now, again, as I said, you can prove this in a laptop computer. That if you go back in time, the moon would come back in, spiral in, and hit the Earth uh, 1.4 billion years ago. Now, evolutionists say that the Earth and the Moon are the same age. They say they're four and a half to five billion supposed years old. Most of them say 4.6 billion. But I, if evolutionists were telling the truth, then that would mean that the Moon was attached to the Earth for the first 3.6 billion years. Is that correct? And then it has been moving away ever since. Have I got that right? Hello? Now, there's something else I want you to notice here. Did you notice the bouncing arrow? And did you notice down here, I'm going from the age of the Earth at 4.6 billion and it's getting younger. So did everybody see that now? I want you to, okay, right, here's the bouncing arrow. And then the age of the Earth gets younger. So, was that cool? Oh, come on, that was neat, right? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Well, you want to keep watching these bouncing arrows. You also want to keep, you know, watching the bouncing arrows and the age of the Earth getting younger. Just in your mind, start thinking about erosion for just a minute, okay? There's too much salt in the seas. I mentioned there's too much salt in the Dead Sea, but there's too much salt in the regular seas as well. Today, the oceans are approximately 3.5% salt content. Now, the total amount of salt in the oceans today would accumulate at current rates of accumulation between 42 and 62 million years. That makes the Earth's oceans less than 62 million years old, which of course would make the Earth younger. Is that right? And this is the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse, made famous in the United States. It's in North Carolina. It was built in 1870, one of the most historic lighthouses in the United States. When it was built in 1870, it was 1,500 feet from the water. Okay, so it was 1,500 feet from the ocean in 1870. Uh, in 1989, 116 years later, it was 160 feet from the ocean. I don't think the lighthouse moved. Well, actually it did. You see, in 1999, we moved it back 2,950 feet from the water to try to preserve it as a historic lighthouse. But even now, we think it may only preserve it for another 100 years. And uh, let's think about this erosion problem. These are the White Cliffs of Dover, made famous in song and history. Now, evolutionists say that the White Cliffs of Dover are Cretaceous deposits made 65 million supposed years ago. Now, the White Cliffs of Dover are basically trillions of single-celled creatures called diatoms that are fossilized. Um, it's actually what you make toothpaste out of. It is. That's the abrasive in toothpaste. Now, let's think about this. According to evolutionists, the White Cliffs of Dover are 65 million years old, correct? I don't think so. Now, it will be gone in about 2,000 years. This is one reason why I know scientifically that the Lord Jesus is coming back sometime fairly soon. Because I've read the book and there's going to be people here to meet him. And because of the decay of the Earth's magnetic field, the Earth isn't going to last for a whole lot longer. But if I go back in time and double the strength of the magnetic field every 1400 years, well, 10,000 years ago, the strength of the field would kill all life on Earth. So if you go back to what would be 8,000 BC, the Earth's magnetic field would be so strong it would kill all life on Earth. Without it, the sun would kill all life on Earth, and it'll be gone in about 2,000 years. We live in a very narrow band of time. Think with me. Based on the strength of the Earth's magnetic field, all life would be dead 10,000 years ago. So if no life, no living organism could possibly exist on Earth even 10,000 years ago, if there had been a 10,000 years ago, then is it possible for evolution to have been occurring on the Earth for the last one and a half to four billion supposed years? Well, no. And it's not going to last a whole lot longer. And then, of course, we have what are called short period comets. Now, I'm sure many of you have seen comets in your lifetime. And comets are basically big, dirty ice balls. They're just big, dirty ice balls. They're just rock and ice. Um, we've taken close-up pictures. We've sampled them and so forth. 
Now, now comets go around the sun. They get very close to the sun. When they get close to the sun, they melt. So they lose about 3 to 5% of their mass every time they go by. So let's think about this. We have these comets that are called short period comets. Now, almost all comets are short period comets. There are a few long period comets. Now, short period comet means it has an orbit of 200 years or less. Now, let's think about this. We still have short period comets in the solar system. They would all be gone in less than 10,000 years. So the fact that we still have short period comets says that the solar system is less than 10,000 years old. Even the long period comets would be gone within 100,000 years. Well, that makes the solar system and the Earth young. And then, of course, there's too much uranium in the oceans. You see, uranium is a salt in nature. It dissolves in water and will go into the oceans. But there's too much uranium in the Earth's oceans for the Earth's oceans to be billions of years old. As a matter of fact, it limits the age of the oceans to less than 10,000 years old. Well, that would make the Earth young. And then, of course, high-pressure natural gas and natural oil wells still exist on Earth. Um, not too long ago, I was in our state of Arkansas. There were hundreds and hundreds of nat natural gas wells. And uh, in our state of Arkansas, they were still finding natural gas at pressures of 9,000 pounds per square inch. But around the world, we still find natural gas wells up to 20,000 pounds per square inch. Now think with me. You only find natural gas, natural oil, and natural coal between layers of dried out mud or some kind of sandstone. Now sandstone has porosity. I mean, when you go down to the beach and you see the wave come in and hit the beach, well, the wave comes back into the water, but you'll see the the water go down in between the sand grains, correct? So sandstone has porosity. And gas can leak through a rock. You can actually put your gas through a rock if the rock is sedimentary. You give me any natural gas that occurs on Earth, any natural piece of sedimentary rock, give me any pressure you want to start at, I will take it into a laboratory and I will tell you how long it takes to push a gas through a rock. Because you can push it through a rock if it's sedimentary. Well. The problem is this, no natural gas or oil well we have ever found could be more than 100,000 years old or the pressure would already have been released into the atmosphere and that of course would make the earth young. I've noticed these arrows are all stacking up on the right side, how about you? And uh, there's not enough Stone Age skeletons. Now if a skeleton is buried in the ground, well if it doesn't become fossilized, it will still decompose. The molecular bonds will break down, and over time the bone will actually turn to dust if it's not fossilized. Now here's the problem about Stone Age skeletons. Skeletons are said to last perhaps 200, 250,000 years before they're just dust in the ground. Um, assuming a Stone Age population of 1 to 10 million at any one time, and let's say the Stone Age of, well, supposedly produced people was 185,000 years, well that would mean you'd have eight billion burials. Please tell me, where is the evidence? Where are the artifacts? Where are the skeletons? We only find a few thousand skeletons in the ground. This actually proves that the earth is young, limits the Stone Age to a few hundred years. Well, that sounds biblical. What is the, quote, Stone Age, unquote? Well, let me ask you the first question. Has there ever been a time on earth when there was not a Stone Age? Did you hear that question? Has there ever been a time on earth when people didn't use stone tools? No, there's never been a time on Earth when people didn't use stone. We still use stone tools today. Has there ever been a time on Earth when there wasn't an Iron Age or a Copper Age? Well, think about it. According to the Bible, Tubal Cain, three generations from Adam, was smelting ores before the flood. Is that correct? And I just showed you a pre flood bell. Is that correct? Well, the fact of the matter is, what is what they say, the Stone Age? The Stone Age is nothing but the people living in the area of the Middle East, leaving at the time of the Tower of Babel experience, and migrating to Europe, living in caves for a couple of hundred years, which was a smart thing to do in Europe, because I think you'll agree, you know, you think of Neanderthals, Cro-Magnons, and so forth, they're living in caves in Europe. Now that's a smart thing to do in Europe, because, uh, you know, they're cool in the summer, they're, you know, warm in the winter, and they're incredibly cheap to build. And of course today you can study Neanderthal culture. They had language, art, music. They were religious. They buried their dead with religious artifacts and graves and so forth. They were absolutely, totally, 100% human. Even the DNA proves that they're human. So uh, 
The Stone Age is just nothing but the people who left the Tower of Babel and migrated to Europe and lived there for a couple hundred years establishing civilization. And dinosaurs lived recently. You know, when I was growing up at Berkeley, they told me dinosaurs haven't existed 65, 70 million years. They all became extinct. That a human being never saw a dinosaur. When I was an evolutionist, I believed that. I don't anymore. You see, when you go to these natural history museums, they show you all these fossils of dinosaurs and dioramas and so forth. They tell you, oh, you know, they've been dead for 65, 70 million years. I don't think so anymore. For example, how many of you know, 1990, we found dinosaur blood cells in a T-Rex bone and the hemoglobin was still in the blood cells. You don't believe me? This is an actual photograph of dinosaur blood cells in a T-Rex bone found in 1990 in Montana by the evolutionist paleontologist, Dr. Mary Schweitzer. Now, Dr. Mary Schweitzer is an incredibly intelligent woman, unfortunately still an evolutionist, but she's a very talented paleontologist, a very intelligent woman. And in 1990, now she's a bone digger. She likes to dig bones, and she really likes to dig up T-Rex bones, and you only dig up T-Rex bones in Montana. So she's working at Montana State University Northern Campus in 1990, she's out digging up T-Rex bones and she finds blood cells inside. Well, obviously this discovery refuted evolution, is that correct? I mean, I don't know about a problem that I have. I have a big problem with blood cells lasting 65, 68 million years in the ground. How about you? You know? Well, when she found this contradiction to evolution, the university wanted to reward her, so they fired her. <clears throat> but being a very resourceful, very intelligent woman, um, she got a job at a actually better university. It was kind of like being kicked upstairs. She got a job with North Carolina State University. In March of 2005, she's back in Montana digging up T-Rex bones because that's what she really likes to do. And she found this, dinosaur flesh. This is real, fresh dinosaur flesh. It was soft, moist, resilient. You could squeeze the blood out of it. This little ligament right here was still elastic. You could pull it apart and it would snap back together. This is a blood vessel. These are blood cells. She is asking this question. How could these cells last for 65 million years? I think she's asking the wrong question. I think the question she should be asking is, are they 65 million years old? And in Spain, reported by the National Geographic magazine, well, this is 2006, we found supposedly 10 million year old frog and salamander fossils, but inside we found fresh bone marrow. Again, I have a problem believing that bone marrow could live and you know, exist in the ground for 10 million years, you know? And we have found what are called living index or key fossils. Now, let me explain something, folks. I said earlier, Evolutionists do not use radiometric dating processes to date anything because they all have five false assumptions, seven false assumptions, and none of them work, correct? So how do evolutionists date these layers that are in the ground? They don't use these modern scientific techniques because they don't work. This is actually how they do it. They tell us how old the rock layer is by the fossil you find in it. Then they tell you how old the fossil is by the rock layer you found it in. Should I repeat myself? They tell us how old the rock is by the fossil you find in it. Then they tell you how old the fossil is by the rock you found it in. Everybody with me? Yeah. And these fossils are called key or index fossils. Now, the problem is we find them alive today. For example, the coelacanth fish, the lobed fin fish that's so ugly only a mother would love it, supposedly extinct for 70 million years. A hundred million supposed years ago, this is the fish that supposedly evolved into the amphibians and then became extinct itself 70 million years ago, after it evolved into the amphibians. Or the Neopelina, a mollusk supposedly extinct for 280 million years. Or the Lingula, a brachiopod supposedly extinct for 400 million years. Or the Taro branch, supposedly extinct for 300 million years have all been found alive recently. The coelacanth was found alive in December of 1938 in the Comoros Islands, north of Madagascar, east of Africa. Um, but they were found alive in December of 1938. 
They have never changed. They look exactly like fossils that are supposed to be over 300 million years old. They've never changed and they're still alive. Now, if they're alive and they've never changed, is it possible that they could have evolved into the amphibians? Well, that's a stretch. And exactly 60 years later, in 1998, we found another population of coelacanths alive off the coast of Indonesia, 5,000 miles away from the first population. Evolutions are starting to say, well, you know, they're not extinct, and maybe they're a lot more common than we thought they used to be, you know? Well, all of these have been found alive recently. Now let's think about this and kind of wrapping things up. We have evidence that the Earth and the universe cannot be old. We have more than enough evidence to convict, perfectly consistent with 6,000 years of age. Now, let's be good scientists. Let's take a look at the sheer weight of evidence. Now, evolutionists have five major arguments in which they suggest it may be billions of years old, but there's not one ounce of proof that it is old. Evolutionists have not one proof that is undeniable that it is old. They only have five major arguments to suggest it might be old. We have over 200 arguments to suggest and prove it is young, okay? So they have five arguments that suggest it might be old. We have over 200 arguments that prove it's young. Now let's just be good scientists. Now just sheer weight of evidence, which one of those two would you go with? Well, I think young is the only reasonable scientific answer. Now, Sir Charles Lyell, the evolutionist who was the mentor of Charles Darwin, wrote a set of four books starting in 1830 to 1837 called Principles of Geology, Volumes 1, 2, 3, 4. And these are the basic books that are the foundation of all evolutionary geology today. He is the man most responsible for the expression, the present is the key to the past. Now evolutionists believe in what is called uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism means this, it's the belief, the faith belief, that all the natural laws, all the natural principles, everything has acted uniformly in exactly the same way for an eternity past. So an evolutionist believes in uniformitarianism. It is the belief that all the natural laws, all the natural processes have acted uniformly throughout an eternal past, and that only random chance working through eternal mass, energy, and time have produced all the complexity we see in the universe today. Now here's my last comment to you folks. If Charles Lyell, this great evolutionist, is correct, if the present is the key to the past, then it all has to be young and cannot be old. The Green River Formation is a layer of rock in Wyoming that contains possibly hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of finely stratified layers. Well, if you go to our museum, you can get that little glass thing with two pieces of glass and different colored sand in between. You flip it over and it makes dozens and dozens of layers in a matter of a few seconds. Well, when they dig through the Green River, they'll say, here's a picture of the Green River Formation. They'll say, oh, each of these layers is a different season, and they go by the pollen. They say some have, there's certain pollen produced by trees in the spring. A different kind of tree produces pollen in the fall. And if you look at these layers, it's got the spring, fall, spring, fall, spring, fall. I mean, like maybe even a million times. And they call them annual layers because of the pollen. Well, the truth of the matter is, all those things would sort very rapidly, just like the thing in our museum does, sorts things very rapidly. Multiple, there's only two densities of colored sand in there, black and white, but it'll make, you know, 40 layers in a few seconds. Multiple layering, ma massive layering forms quickly. If you dig through this Green River Formation, you find layers of ash in there from apparently a volcanic eruption. As they drill down through the ash, they count the number of layers between the two ash layers, the number of layers of Green River Formation. And it's up to 35% difference in two different places. You drill one hole, you got 100 layers. You drill another hole, you only got, you know, 60 layers. What's, why would that be? You know, if those layers are really annual rings, then they should be consistent throughout the whole thing, and it's simply not. So get the article in Creation Magazine if somebody ever says to you the Green River Formation proves the Earth is millions of years old. It does not. I am sure not the world's expert on carbon dating, but I think I can explain things. I'm a teacher. I can explain it as best I can.
That's what a teacher is supposed to do. Take the complex and explain it where the average person can get it. And say, since I operate about fourth grade level, you know, I got to understand it myself first so I, so I can explain it. Let me explain how carbon dating is supposed to work and then tell you the serious problems with it. Carbon, carbon dating was not invented until 1949 in the last 60 years. <clears throat> so when they started telling the kids the earth is billions of years old back in 1830, they didn't tell them because of carbon dating. They never thought of carbon dating, never been heard of, okay? Why were they teaching the earth is billions of years old 160 years ago? Well, because they needed billions of years to make their theory look good. That's why. I mean, if I told you a frog could turn into a prince if you kiss it, you'd all say, well, it's a fairy tale. But if I told you, hey, kids, the frog can turn to the prince if you wait billions of years. Oh, ah, maybe so. <laughs> now it becomes believable. No, it's still a fairy tale. It's a stupid idea. But the geologic column is where it all started. <clears throat> we covered that on video four and some more on video six about the geologic column. The earth was divided up into layers, Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic, Archaeozoic. Each layer was assigned a name, an age, and an index fossil. We covered that on video four. Then <clears throat> they said, now we have to prove these layers are old. So they picked the numbers out of the clear blue sky, and any dating technique that comes along, like carbon dating or any other, has to match the geologic column or it's rejected. Only because the geologic column's been taught for 180 years now. So surely it's true. <laughs> no, just because it's been taught 180 years doesn't make it true. But that's the logic those scientists will have. Well, we know the geologic column is established, therefore any carbon dates we get should match that. If they don't, we'll throw them out, and we'll keep testing till we do. They might have to test a sample five or six times till they get the number they want. Well, how do you know any of them are right then? If you're getting a different number every time, how would you know any of them are right? Radiometric dating would not have been feasible if the geologic column had not been erected first. Ever since William Smith at the beginning of the 19th century, fossils have been and still are the best and most accurate method of dating and correlating the rocks in which they occur. Apart from very modern examples, which really are archaeology, I can think of no cases of radioactive decay used to date fossils. They don't date fossils by carbon dating, they date them by their geologic position. That's how it's done. But here's, here's, here's what happens. <clears throat> Earth's atmosphere is about 100 miles thick. Space shuttle, in order to get free from friction, has to get up about 100 miles to be able to outside the air. And, you know, straight up, 100 miles is not that far from here to halfway to Tallahassee, you know. But if you go up, look at the atmosphere, it has different, it's very distinct layers to it, which is kind of interesting. It has a heat sink where it gets very, very cold up about 7 or 8 miles up, like 80 or 90 or 100 below zero. But the Earth's atmosphere contains mostly nitrogen, 78% nitrogen, 20%, 21% oxygen, a little bit of CO2 for plants to breathe. Well, these don't breathe it, they're fake, but uh, plants breathe in carbon dioxide. And there's a very tiny little bit of radioactive carbon-14, 0.000765%. This radioactive carbon-14 is different than regular carbon. It's produced by radiation striking the sun, striking the atmosphere. Sunlight strikes the atmosphere, slaps the nitrogen around, and turns it into carbon-14. So it all starts by the sunlight hitting the atmosphere. Just to give you the procedure here, about 21 pounds of carbon-14 is produced every year, and that is spread out all over the world. If I told you there's 21 pounds of gold, but it's spread out equally all over the world, forget it, I'm not even gonna go look for it, okay? <laughs> You're not gonna find it. Real tiny amounts. If you look at a periodic table, carbon and nitrogen are right next to each other. Nitrogen has an atomic weight of 14, carbon has an atomic weight of 12. But if the sunlight slaps the nitrogen around, it'll knock a few things off of it, and it becomes carbon-14. So it still weighs as much as the nitrogen, but now it's considered a carbon. It's called radioactive, which does not mean it listens to the radio. It's just, uh, it's unstable, and it's going to break apart. It's like three guys dating the same girl. That relationship's not going to last, okay, forever. Something will go wrong, right? <clears throat> Find the one you want, Jonathan, and just marry her and be happy the rest of your life, right? Carbon-14 is unstable. It does not like being carbon-14. It wants to get out of this situation, so it breaks down. About half of it will break down on a statistical average. About half of it is going to fall apart every 5,700 years. Now, it is doing this on a purely random procedure. I mean, you got a pile of mo molecules. You never know which one's going to fall apart. But statistics tell us about half of them will fall apart every 5,700 years, roughly. Now. <clears throat> 
while it is carbon-14, it's floating around in the atmosphere, like the rest of the carbon, and it latches onto oxygen, like carbon often does, and becomes carbon dioxide. And they hook up and they're happily floating around the atmosphere. And the plants are breathing in CO2. Animals come along and eat the plants. So the only way carbon-14 gets into the living world is from the atmosphere, it's produced by the sun, striking the atmosphere, plants breathe it in, animals eat the plants. Probably during your lifetime you've either eaten plants or you've eaten animals that have eaten plants. How many have ever done that before? Like today for lunch, right? Okay. Everything we do is from one of those two sources. It's plants or it's animals that ate plants. Well, the plants are absorbing CO2. <clears throat> Some of it is radioactive. So if the atmosphere contains 0.0000765%, it is assumed that the plants also have 0.0000765%. Probably a reasonable assumption, and I don't argue with them. I just point out this is one of dozens of assumptions that can enter in to really mess up things like carbon dating. So probably you have 0.0000765% carbon in you because you've been eating these plants or you've been eating the animals that have eaten the plants. So probably it's all balanced in nature. When the plant or animal dies, it stops eating, stops taking in more C14, it stops breathing. Okay? Now whatever it had is going to decay. It was decaying while it was alive, but now there's nothing to replace it. So what they do is they compare the amount of C14 in the fossil with the amount in the atmosphere and say, wow, this fossil's only got half as much, therefore it's been dead for one half-life, 5,700 years. Because it continues to decay after it died, but now it can't be replaced. So while it was alive, it should have had about 0.0000765%. If it's only got 0.0000325%, it's been dead for one half-life, or two half-lives, or three half-lives, etc. In theory, it never goes to zero. <clears throat> but for practical purposes, you can't measure beyond a certain amount. You know, you're going to run out of stuff to measure. It goes from a half to a fourth to an eighth to a sixteenth to not enough to measure. A great article came out from Institute for Creation Research. They're the ones that did the rate project, ICR.org. They said, with their short 5,700-year half-life, no carbon-14 atoms should exist in any carbon older than a quarter million years. It should all be gone. Yet it's proven impossible to find any natural source of carbon below the Ice Age that does not contain significant amounts of carbon-14. Even though such strata are supposed to be millions or billions of years old, conventional carbon-14 laboratories have been, have been aware of this anomaly since early 80s and have striven to eliminate it and are unable to account for it. Lately, the world's best such laboratory, which has learned during two decades of low C14 measurements how not to contaminate specimens externally, under contract to creationists, they confirmed such observations for coal samples and even for a dozen diamonds. I think what that means. The textbooks will tell you coal formed 250 million years ago in the Carboniferous era. And yet when they test coal, it still has carbon-14. How is that possible? If all the carbon-14 atoms would have disappeared in, say, 30, 40, 50,000 years, why would there still be carbon-14 atoms in coal? I got an idea. Um, it's not a quarter million years old. Ooh, boy, they don't like that answer. They'll keep searching until they find another answer because they don't like that one for sure. And diamonds, which they say, you know, formed millions and millions of years ago, you know, they still have carbon-14 in them. And it's not possible to contaminate one of those things. I mean, it's the hardest substance we have. So how do you get carbon-14 in diamonds? And when did diamonds form? Well, I'm not sure when they formed. I know Superman makes them in a few minutes. You know, take a piece of coal, <laughs> squeeze it, he's got a diamond to give to, what's their name, you know? But uh, olive oil. Uh, and so, it, and they've learned, they've learned today, just in the last uh, in the last 20 years, I guess, how to uh, make diamonds that are just indistinguishable from natural diamonds. High pressure. They've been doing it for years, making artificial diamonds, uh, but they can't get them very big. Now, just I think in 2005, they were able to get di big diamonds with a synthetic process. They do it with uh, pets and loved ones. Take your pet. That's right. Uh, burn the body, cremate it, pressure it into a diamond, and you can wear your your dog the rest of your life. You know. Or, something, or your, your, your ex-wife, you know, or whatever. I don't think I'd want to do that. Uh, we were talking about that on the radio yesterday. Um, anyway, the guy said these diamonds even have carbon-14. It says this cannot be contaminated. Uh, those constitute very strong evidence the Earth is only thousands, not billions of years old. Now, the Rate Project book is difficult reading, heavy reading. Jonathan, you're awful smart. How far did you make it through the book? About halfway right now. 
about halfway and it's taken you almost a year. Yeah, it's, it's heavy reading. If you want the simplified, you know, don't go down quite so deep version, this one is excellent by Donald DeYoung, Thousands Not Billions. He kind of summarizes in real English what they said, different ways to show it. Look, it's not billions of years old. But the carbon dating assumptions need to be, need to be pointed out. They'll say, well, we know carbon decays at a certain rate, and so we know if it's only got half as much, it's, it's half as old. There's some assumptions that mess up everything. I'll show you how it works. If I said, we're going to fill a barrel with water. So I hand Leah the hose, here Leah, fill this barrel with water. But what you don't know is I have drilled holes in the barrel. While you're putting it in, the water's leaking out. It's kind of like your checkbook, you know, you keep putting it in and it keeps leaking out someplace, right? How many discovered that as you live along? You got the ring, Jonathan, you're discovering now, right? Well, the Earth's atmosphere is kind of like this barrel. It's always getting brand new carbon-14, 21 pounds every year, being put in. And it's always leaking out through decay. So, the question would be, how long would it take to reach a stage called equilibrium? Now, with a barrel, you can actually do the math and calculate. If I'm going to put in you know, a certain amount of water per minute, and a certain amount per minute leaks out, when will I reach equilibrium and where? That can all be calculated you know, with a little bit of math. And with the atmosphere, they said, well, when would the atmosphere reach equilibrium? So the guys who invented carbon dating in the late 40s said, I wonder about this Earth's atmosphere reaching equilibrium. They did a bunch of studies on that and said, now, if we took a brand new planet Earth, created it from scratch, poof, got it going around the sun, how long would it take to reach this equilibrium point in the atmosphere where the production rate and the destruction rate is the same? And they, they determined it would take about 30,000 years to reach equilibrium. I'm not sure how they did all that. You could probably see uh, some of the rate scientists and figured it out. But then they made two mistakes, in my totally unbiased opinion. They said, number one, we know the Earth is millions of years old. Mistake number one. Number two, they said, we can ignore the equilibrium problem. Because we would have passed that point 30,000 years ago. You know, they've discovered the Earth has still not reached equilibrium. Radiocarbon is still forming. 30 to 40 percent faster than it's decaying. Now think about that. If radiocarbon is still forming faster than it's decaying, that means the Earth is less than 30,000 years old, number one. And number two, you can't carbon date anything. Because you'd have to know when it lived so that you could calculate when it lived. You would have to already know when it lived to figure out how much carbon-14 was it breathing at that time. It doesn't work. There's a website, www.archie.org. He's got more stuff on the Earth has not reached equilibrium, if you want some articles there, by Ron Cooper. But this is a calibration curve. If an animal is still alive, it should give you about 16 clicks on your Geiger counter per minute per gram. If you're only getting eight, you say it's been through one half-life, or four clicks, or it's been through two half-lives, or three half-lives, etc. This is called a calibration curve. In theory, it sounds like it should work, but there are several real obvious assumptions, and I don't know how they don't see it. Suppose you walked into a room and I said, uh, I want you to tell me, here's this candle burning on a table. When was it lit? Find out it's seven inches tall. I say, well, that won't tell me anything. Now we've got to measure how fast it's burning. We measure the candle for a while. We get an Olympic stopwatch and we get it down to the nearest 40 bazillionths of a second. Okay, And we all agree the candle is burning an inch an hour. Here's our two facts. Seven inches tall, burning an inch an hour. When was it lit? Mary, can't figure it out? Nobody can figure it out. Unless you make some assumptions. Assumption number one, how tall was the candle? And assumption number two, has it always burned at the same rate? Neither of those can be known. If you find a fossil in the dirt, the amount of carbon can be measured, the rate of decay can be determined. I don't argue with either of those. How much was in it when it lived? I don't know. Has it always decayed at the same rate? I don't know. Has it been contaminated, sitting there in the ground for all these millions of years? There's no way to know those things. If the Earth had a canopy of water above the atmosphere, or a canopy of ice, as we cover on Seminar 2, that would have blocked out a lot of radiation from the Sun, which would have prevented most of the carbon-14 from even forming. So animals that lived before the Flood would have lived in a world with much less carbon-14 to begin with, maybe none, but certainly less. And when we dig up the fossil that's been buried for 4,400 years, let's say it started with 4, where today we start with 16. 
We dig it up 40, 400 years after the flood and say, wow, here's a mammoth that got buried and it's carbon dated. Well, we're assuming it started at 16. When we test it and find it's got two, we're going to say, oh, it's been through four half-lives. When it's actually only been through one half-life. Which is why it never works. When they first invented carbon dating, 1949, Willard Libby, they did some testing and they said, the lower leg of a mammoth was 15,000 years old, but the skin was 21,000. How can two parts of the same animal be different ages? Quite obviously, we know one of the numbers is wrong. So how would you know either of them are right? And if either one's right, how would you know which one? I see no way to tell. Well, let's see if it's getting better. Fourteen years later, they tested a living mollusk, a clam, and it was 2,300 years old. Still alive. In 1970, at the Nobel Symposium, they said, if a carbon date supports our theories, we put it in the main text. If it does not entirely contradict them, we put it in a footnote. If it's completely out of date, we just drop it. You mean they can, they can pick and choose any numbers they want? Exactly correct. If the number doesn't fit what they expected, they throw the number out. 1971, freshly killed seal was 1,300 years old when they carbon dated it. Troubles with carbon dating are undeniably deep and serious. Despite 35 years of technological refinement and better understanding, the underlying assumptions have been strongly challenged and warnings are out that radiocarbon dating may soon find itself in a crisis situation. Continuing use of the method depends on a fix-it-as-we-go approach, allowing for contamination here, fractionation there, and calibration wherever possible. It should be no surprise then that fully half the dates are rejected. Did you follow that? Out of thousands of carbon dates that have been carbon dating times that they've done it, half of the numbers are thrown out. How do they know they're wrong? And also, how would you know the other half is right? If half your test results have to be thrown out, it ought to raise red flags in somebody's brain. Wait a minute. This is stupid. What are we doing? We're wasting our time here. And the article goes on to say, The wonder is, surely, that the remaining half have come to be accepted. No matter how useful it is, the radiocarbon method is still not capable of yield yielding accurate and reliable results. There are gross discrepancies, the chronology is uneven and relative, and the accepted dates are actually selected dates. This whole blessed thing is nothing but 13th century alchemy. And I agree. That's 1981. Now, I've got all these in chronological order. It never gets better. 1984, living snails carbon dated 27,000 years old. 1992. Two mammoths found side by side, they carbon date them, one is 22,000, the other is 16,000. Which one's right? Or are both of them wrong? Or are both of them right? There is no possible way to tell. In 1996, Carl Swisher at Berkeley University used the most advanced techniques to date human fossils. Says last spring he was reevaluating Homo erectus skulls found in Java in the 1930s. He was testing the sediment found with them. The species was supposed to be extinct for a quarter million years. Swisher used two different dating methods. He kept making the same startling find. The bones were 53,000 years at most and possibly no more than 27,000. Well, I'd like to point out two things here. He's looking for a quarter million as his answer, but he keeps getting 53 to 27,000, okay? Which is only one fourth of what he wants, one fifth of what he wants, okay? But he's still getting a 96% error. I mean, is it 27,000 or 53,000? This is not an exact science. So when they publish an article in the paper and say, we found a dinosaur bone or a mammoth bone, and it was, you know, 17,221 years old in six months and three days. Like, <laughs> right, come on. You don't know that. They're making up this stuff. Just absolutely making it up. Professor Reiner Proch von Zeiten, uh, earlier the February 9th of 2005, was uh, resigned from a professor because he'd been lying about carbon dating for years. He, his, his frauds were exposed in February of 2005. He had dated the Bischoff spire skeleton at 21,300 years old, but when they tested him at Oxford, they showed it said it's only 3,300 years old. 700% error. He had said, Professor Proch had said he had found the oldest German, the first German to ever move to Germany, 27,400 years old. They tested it at Oxford and said, this is an old man that died in 1750. He's 250 years old. The professor had been lying about this stuff for decades, and so he finally resigned in disgrace. Well, he should, okay? 
Uh, one part of a mammoth dated 29,000 years old, another part was 44,000. You talk about a slow birth. That would be it, okay? I like this article from <laughs> Rand McNally. The last two years, an absolute date was obtained for the Gandong beds above the Trinil beds. That's in Indonesia. It has the interesting value of 300,000 years, plus or minus 300,000 years. Boy, they nailed that one right on the head, didn't they? Plus or minus, you know, 300% error. In the uh, Geological Survey Professional Paper 862, and I get some flack over this, but I've got the paper in the library somewhere. We couldn't find it here. They, there's all kinds of articles about carbon dating things in Alaska. I just want to show you a few things here. They carbon dated sample number uh, SI 454. See that on the map there, on the chart there? And said it was 17,210 years, plus or minus 500. Then they sent test, 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 tested sample SI 455 and said it's 24,140 years old. Well, 17,000, 24,000, say, wow, that's working good, until you find out that's the same sample as 454. Very same sample. Test it again. So is it 17,000 or 24,000? Sample number uh, 299 was less than 20,000 years old. That little carrot means less than. Sample number L137X is greater than 28,000. We say, well, see, it's working good. This sample is less than 20,000. This other sample is greater than 28 until you find out it's the same sample as 299. How can a sample be less than 20 and greater than 28 at the same time? I taught algebra for a long time. I don't think that's, I don't think you can do such a thing. That's not, not too good. Living penguins were dated at 8,000 years old. Um, materials from layers where dinosaur bones were found are carbon dated 34,000 years old. I was in a debate one time and this professor was getting so upset. Finally, he said, how can you use Reader's Digest as a, as a resource? I said, sir, I use Reader's Digest as a resource for the picture of the dinosaur bone, okay? <laughs> it's not the resource for the fact, okay? It's the, that's where I got the picture from. Oh, okay, okay. So we went on to the debate. But yes, dinosaurs ought to date, you know, 70 million years old. A Russian scientist dated dinosaur bones at less than 30,000 years old. Hugh Miller from Columbus, Ohio took in four dinosaur bone samples and said, would you carbon date these? And they charged like 600 bucks to carbon date something. They carbon dated them and said they're less than 20,000 years old. He said, oh, by the way, these are dinosaur bones. They said, oh, well, then they're not 20,000. We've got to test them again. Why can't they be 20,000? They said, well, we know dinosaurs lived 70 million years ago, so if you had told us that, we never would have carbon dated them. One friend of mine died here several years ago, but he was digging, doing a lot of archaeological work, and he dug down in this well and he found layers of burned wood, which is good to carbon date, because obviously, you know, it had carbon in it. And he put them in a bag, sample number A, from such and such a layer. How many feet down? He labeled it A. Dug down 10 more feet, hit another layer of burned wood. A city had been destroyed, or 20 feet, whatever it was. He labeled it sample B. He took them in to have them carbon dated, paid them the 600 bucks, they said, sample A is, I forget, 3,000 years old, and this one's 4,000 years old. He waited six months, <clears throat> switched the labels, took them back in, same laboratory, said, I want you to carbon date these samples. Now, sample B, the lower one, is in the uh, top bag. So just switch the labels, and they give them the same results, 3,000 and 4,000. It doesn't work. It's never worked. Here's things to consider about carbon dating. When the sample of you date a sample of known age, it doesn't work. If you date a sample of unknown age, it is assumed to work. That's not science, okay? As things decay, they produce helium. This helium, the amount of helium in the atmosphere, is only enough to account for a few thousand or a few million years, not billions of years. There's a book called The Mythology of Modern Dating Methods by ICR, if you want to read stuff on that. They do a lot of testing on this. They're probably the experts in the creation community. This guy said, the rocks do date the fossils, but the fossils date the rocks more accurately. That's ludicrous, okay? And it all based on circular reasoning. They've known that for centuries. We'll cover more on that on video four. I talked to uh, uh, James P. Dawson. He's going to be on our radio program tonight, actually, Jonathan. He's supposed to call in. Uh, J James Dawson was one of the guys working on dating the moon rocks. They brought back moon rocks, gave them to his laboratory, and said, how old is the moon rock? He took specimen number 10017, divided it into six pieces, and tested it many, many times. How old is it? 
they got numbers ranging from two and a half billion to four point six billion. That's a five hundred percent error, or hundred percent error. I talked to him back in '99, uh, and he's in Oklahoma. There's his phone number. He was chief of engineering and operations for the Lunar and Earth Science Division of the Manned Spacecraft Center in NASA in Houston. He worked on lunar samples, including the Genesis rock. He told me they found ages from 10,000 years to several billion in the same rock. His website, jpdawson.com. How can one rock be 10,000 years old and several billion years old at the same time? Something is wrong, okay? The book Bones of Contention has a great chapter uh, at the end called The Dating Game, showing how that they will just change the dates whenever necessary. Uh, if it doesn't fit the theory, oh, let's test it again until it fits the theory. See, the theory is important. The facts are not. Evolution, as I've said many times, is a carefully protected state religion. And that's all it is. What about potassium argon dating? Does that work? Actually, the numbers are bigger, but the problems and assumptions are exactly the same, and you can demonstrate it doesn't work. Potassium decays very slowly. This chart shows the different elements in their half-life. Carbon has a half-life around 5,700 years. But potassium, it takes 1.3 billion years, with a B, for half of that to disappear. Very slowly decays. By the way, I would like to point out, Your Honor, just for, you know, appeal, that all of the dating methods are based on the decay of an element. Uranium decays to lead. Potassium decays to argon. They're all moving down the periodic table, not up. All going down. Just point out, keep that in mind in case we need to appeal this case, all right? 80% of the potassium in a small sample of iron meteorite can be removed by distilled water in four and a half hours. Well, if you can take out 80% of it in four and a half hours, how can you trust any dates you're going to obtain by that? The Canadian Journal of Earth Science ran an article and said, In conventional interpretation of potassium argon age, it's common to discard ages which are too substantial, uh, substantially too high or too low compared to the rest of the group, or with other available data such as the geologic time scale. There it is. If you test a sample and its number's too high or too low or doesn't match the geologic column, it gets thrown out. Well, then why are you wasting your time and money testing it? You already know how old you'd like it to be. Give it a number. Pick a number. It's dumb. The KBS tuff, a tuff is a layer of ash or lava, or generally ash, that has been packed and turned into rock. It's called tuff, T-U-F-F. -F. K. Brenzenmeyer had been dating these samples of pota with potassium argon dating because here's the theory. When a volcano erupts, the rocks and stuff coming out is really hot and any gases in it should be able to escape. Well, potassium slowly turns into argon and argon is a gas. They use it for welding over at the shop. Argon welding, you know. Argon's a gas. So since potassium turns to argon, when the rock gets melted and shot out of a volcano, all the gas escapes and so the theory says, this new layer should have been, the, the clock is now reset. It is zero years old. Even though when it was in the earth, it's, you know, four billion years old, now all the argon's gone because it accumulated this argon for millions of years, but now, poof, it melted and the gas is gone. So we can potassium argon date this lava or ash or any volcanic material. Well, they had been dating this layer of ash named after Kay Brenzenmeyer because she did research on it. They said it's 212 to 230 million years old. All the scientists agreed that layer of ash is around 200 million years old. Until Richard Leakey came along in 1972, and he's digging around under the KBS tuff, and he finds a perfectly normal human skull. Everybody panicked and said, wow, how can you have a normal human skull under 200 million year old rock when man didn't even evolve till like 3 million years ago? That's not possible. And so they looked for things. Was this a burial? Did somebody dig through the rock and bury this person down here? You know, was there an earthquake? Is there a fault line near here someplace? Nope. All we can conclude is there's a normal human skull under 200 million year old rock. So, what do you conclude? Well, one group studied this and said, well, that proves aliens came here 200 million years ago. Would you, would you just consider that maybe the rock's not 200 million years old? After they found out it could not be an intrusion or a burial or anything else, it had to be legitimately placed there. I mean, it was, the person was buried under this ash layer. They took 10 more samples of the KBS tuff and dated them again. Keep in mind, they'd already dated them a bunch of times. And everybody agreed it's 212 million years old. But now they take 10 more samples and check them again and say, oh no, it's only 0.5 
to 2.6 million. Well, that's way down from 212. Okay, they dropped the number way down. But they're still getting a 500% error from 0.5 to 2.6. This is not an exact science. See, back in 1770, they taught the kids the Earth is 70,000 years old. In 1902, 1905, they said it's 2 billion years old. By 1969, when I was a kid and they went to the moon, they brought back moon rocks and said, oh, wow, they're 3.5 billion years old. That was the official age, 3.5 billion. Today they tell, and by the way, they did it with potassium argon dating. You can see the article here from the newspaper. Today they tell the kids it's 4.6 billion years old. Do you realize the Earth is getting older at the rate of 21 million years per year? That's 40 years per minute. Wild dates are always obtained with carbon dating or potassium argon dating. Dates that don't fit the theory are rejected. Only the correct dates ever get published. Well, then why are you wasting anybody's time? Why? It's not science. The original content cannot possibly be known. You can't know there's been no contamination. You can't know that... It's, the decay rates always remain the same. You can't know those things, okay? I'll give you a couple examples of potassium argon problems, and then we'll take a little break. Basalt from Mount Etna in Sicily. By the way, I climbed on Mount Etna when I was over there in Sicily. Uh, it, they knew it erupted in 122 B.C. They said they knew it erupted in 122 B.C. They were written records. With the potassium argon dated it and said it's two and a quarter million years old. Excuse me? It should be like 2,000? When they tested lava from a Hawaiian volcano, they knew it erupted in 1801. They, the people watched it happen. That's the lava flow that covered our village, you know, 1801. It gave an age of 1.6 million years old. That's in 1968. Let's see if it gets better. Basalt from a volcano in Hawaii erupted in 1959. When they tested it, it gave an age of 8.5 million years old. Another volcano in Mount Etna from the 1964 eruption gave an age of 700,000. The 72 eruption gave an age of 350,000. It was erupting when I was over there in 2002, I believe. I don't remember. Lava from Mount St. Helens was tested, which my sister lives just 60 miles from there. They tested the lava from Mount St. Helens, brand new lava coming out of the volcano. Grab a sample. How old is it? They tested it five different ways and got five different numbers. All the way from 350,000 to 2.8 billion. Notice, all five numbers are different number one, and all five numbers are wrong, number two. They're wrong. It doesn't work. So again, when you test a sample of known age, it's assumed to work, and if you test a sample of unknown age, it is, you know, it does, we know it doesn't work when you know the age, but when you don't know the age, well, then they say it works. So it just doesn't work. And I'm tired of them using our tax dollars to call that science. That is not science. That's pure imagination. There's a whole bunch more in the book, Evolution Cruncher, if you want more on that, or in the rate project book, radioactive isotopes, and the age of the earth if you want more. Or there's a whole lot of good stuff in Walt Brown's book, In the Beginning. He's a PhD in physics, Air Force Academy professor for years in Colorado. Um, got great stuff in here. I differ with him on a couple of little things. Of course, I differ with probably everybody on a couple of things. The only one right on everything, of course, is me. But we're trying to get them all converted. Take a five-minute break, and we'll come back and talk about have fresh dinosaur bones been found? Next question we often get asked is, uh, hey, if dinosaurs drowned in the flood, uh, have we found fresh dinosaur bones? Or are they all, if they're all fossilized, it takes millions of years, doesn't it? Well, first, it does not take millions of years for things to fossilize. We covered that on video number six. But yes, some fresh dinosaur bones have been found. There's a great book out called The Great Alaskan Dinosaur Adventure about some guys that went up to northern Alaska and uh, in the riverbanks up there in the Colville River on the north slope of Alaska, found frozen dinosaur bones. I talked to Les Zerbe, my friend up there who's been a missionary for years in uh, Africa, I mean in, in Alaska. I was just up there a few months ago with him. He said he, he, he was there, he could drive right, fly his plane right to the spot, land there, and dig out some fresh frozen dinosaur bones if we'd like. But yes, they have been found in uh, Journal Science magazine in December of 93. They said, uh, report an amazing preservation of the bones of a young duckbill dinosaur found in Montana. Under a microscope, the fine structure of the bones was seen to have been preserved to such an extent that cell characteristics could be compared to cells of chicken bone. Anybody who teaches dinosaurs died millions of years ago has not studied the real evidence. Okay, In northwestern Alaska, uh, in 1961, a geologist found a bed of dinosaur bones in unpermineralized, that's unfossilized condition. This is possibly the same bed that Les Zerbe goes to. He offered to take me last time I was there, but the weather wouldn't permit it. 
We were going to fly up there for a couple hours and see this stuff. I'll go next time I get up there. In Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, which is way on the north slope uh, near uh, Barrow, Alaska, they found frozen dinosaur bones. They're as light as balsa wood and look as fresh as yesterday's dog bones. The structure was porous and the fossils were not mineralized, not fossilized. A Canadian uh, Indian, Eskimo, in 1987 on Bylot Island up in northern Canada, found part of a lower jaw of a duckbill dinosaur. It was in fresh condition. Joe Taylor, our friend from uh, Crosbyton, Texas, has a website, mountblanco.com. He has dug up dinosaur bones before that are not fossilized. He's dug up dinosaurs all over the world. But uh, in uh, the summer of 2005, they found dinosaur tissue inside a T-Rex leg bone, and the dinosaur tissue was still soft. Now, the scientists are trying to figure out, like John Horner from Montana is trying to figure out how could fossils, how could they stay soft for 70 million years? The thought will never cross his mind that maybe they're not 70 million years old. Okay, he's already committed to that. And to say maybe they're only 6,000 years old or 4,400 years old from the flood would absolutely be anathema to them. They'll never consider that. So now they're going to probably get a government grant and try to figure out how could they stay soft for 70 million years. They're totally asking the wrong question. The question is when they formed, not how they formed. Here's a picture from a magazine showing they found a fossilized dinosaur, still had what they thought, and I, I believe was con confirmed, was the heart, soft tissue, fossilized in a dinosaur. Up in Alaska, they frequently find dinosaurs. Well, Alaska's cold. Reptiles don't do well in cold weather. But dinosaurs in Alaska? Not many, but a few have been found. And yes, it's true, some have been found that are not fossilized. You can uh, do more research on that on your own, and we'll cover more on our college class uh, when we get to that. If there really was a flood, I often get the question, well, where were there, where's all the humans? Why aren't there more human bones? There should be, you know, bazillions of human bones buried. I mean, we find lots of clams, find lots of other animals. And it's true, of all the fossils formed, Jonathan, I don't know if you know the percentage. It's like 90% of all the fossils formed are marine organisms. Have you read something like that? And 90 or 98. 90 or 98, you know, animals that live in the water, okay. Very few mammal fossils are found and very few, you know, uh, human fossils are found. Marvin Lubinow, in his book, Bones of Contention, it's the best one I'm aware of on the topic. He's a creationist, but he spent years and years and years, like 25 years, studying all the human remain bones, human remains. He says there are about 4,000 human remains have been found. Now, and it's compared to clams, you know, we find billions of those, or fish, we find billions of those. Why only 4,000? Well, there's a couple of things to consider. Why so few human bones are found? And by the way, they're all 100% human. Actually, the Neanderthals had thicker bones than we have. They were in much better condition. They were like, they say the average Neanderthal could pick up a football player and fling him over the goalpost. I mean, they were just incredible condition. The muscular uh, structure must have been great. But when God made the world 6,000 years ago, there were two people, but it was full of plants and full of animals. 4,400 years later, it was still full of plants and full of animals and still not full of people. I have no idea what the population was at the time of the flood. This is just a pure guess with it, probably a billion people. If you figure they're living 900 years and having 70 or 80 kids per family, uh, you know, that's what you need, Tanya, about 70 kids, right? Uh, it would be a large population in a hurry. But let's just pick a number and say there was a billion. Why are so few found as fossils? Well, the purpose of the flood, according to Genesis, was to destroy man off the earth. That's why God did the flood. The Bible says there were giants in the earth in those days, and there were mighty men of old. So, I don't know for sure what that means, but I suspect that might mean the people were actually bigger before the flood came. We've covered on video two about some of the giant fossil skeletons that have been found. People nine feet tall, ten feet tall, twelve feet tall. I don't know if everybody was that big or not, but certainly it appears some of them were. So there are several th theories of why so, human, so few human bones have been found. Number one, there were less people to be killed. There aren't as many people available. So you're not going to find as many bones of them. Okay? You're going to find more animals and more fish and clams and stuff like that. Secondly, people are smarter than animals. Well, some people. And they would tend to avoid drowning until the last possible minute. Whereas animals would get surprised and covered up and buried, the humans would figure out some way to avoid this. Plus, it probably took about six months to kill everybody. I mean, the flood covered the world, but it doesn't mean it covered the whole world instantly. It rained 40 days and 40 nights. And probably what we see today, the continental shapes and everything, obviously is a pure coincidence based on the water level. And everything was flexing up and down during the flood we covered on video 6. So if the earth was totally different, different configurations, unrecognizable by today's globe, but 
as the crust of the earth is flex flexing up and down, the water slowly coming up from the fountains of the deep that are broken open. <clears throat> the rain was 40 days, but the water kept coming up for 150 days. So if we start with the assumption that during the flood, there were uh, high ground above water may have lasted for six months. The high ground getting smaller and smaller, and people would run to high ground, and they also have the tide. The moon is causing the tide. The moon doesn't know or care that there's a flood on the earth. It's just, you know, pulling the water up. So the tide may go up, cover an area, and then go down, and people and animals would run to the new, newly exposed island. You know, ah, oh, here's high ground. Get over there. So we'd find footprints in these mud, mud layers, that then would get covered up with the next tide. I mean, every six and a half hours, the tide changes. High tide to low tide, six hours and 25 minutes average. So as these mud layers are full of footprints, they bake in the sun just for a couple hours, enough to get a skin on them, and then a new mud layer washes in on top from the next tide. It is highly probable that during this flood, during these first few months of the flood, you would get thousands of layers deposited for multiple reasons. We cover on video six. And you may have footprints within each of these layers. We had a guy called into the radio program yesterday, uh, the guy from Sweden that calls in once in a while, you know, to our radio program, evolutionist. He says, well, we find layers of rock and footprints between the layers. He said, that proves each layer was exposed for thousands of years. No, that proves it was exposed for maybe 30 minutes. <laughs> Not proof, doesn't prove it's exposed for thousands of years. So yes, it's possible to get footprints, and especially if you look at all the, nearly all the footprints are running the same direction. What would that mean? They're trying to avoid something. They're all going the same way. Probably avoiding the flood water. And in Psalm 104, it says, The mountains arose, the valleys sank down. So during the flood, the crust of the earth was all broken up into plates. And they're much more flexible and movable than they are today. Today they're kind of locked into position as most of the water is gone that was underneath, that was lubricating this movement. So they could run to high ground, and then, of course, a couple days later, that may not be high ground. Something else becomes high ground as the plates twist around. So, second reason, though, people are smarter and probably would avoid drowning. If they end up on top, they don't rot. I mean, they rot, they don't fossilize. How many buffalo got killed out west in the last 200 years? Like millions? None of them fossilized. See, things only fossilize if they're buried. So you could have a lot of humans get killed toward the end of the flood, or toward the middle of the flood, I guess, and not be fossilized at all. Thirdly, if humans were bigger, they would not be recognized as human. I mean, if you find a five-foot thigh bone, you're not going to recognize it as a human. You can say, oh, it must be from a, you know, a dinosaur cave bay or something. So those are the reasons why so few human fossils have been found. Fourthly, I'm not sure who's doing the counting. When they say 4,000 have been found, uh, who's counting all these? Marvin Lubinow says that's what he can find in the, in the published record. But how many things have been found that are human, fossilized, in certain layers, but it doesn't match the established scientific paradigm of the day? And so they say, we better not even report this. Because you're not allowed to find humans with dinosaurs, or else, man, you're going to lose your job. You can't go against the evolution theory. It's a carefully protected state religion. I point out, no human and chicken bones have been fossil, found fossilized together in the same rock strata anywhere in the world. So that proves humans and chickens did not live at the same time. No. <laughs> you know that's not good logic, okay? We don't have to find the bones together to prove they live together. We don't have to find the footprints, to, footprints together to prove anything either. No human and chicken footprints have ever been found together. No coelacanth fossils were found for 65 million years of their geologic column. They've got their geologic column and they say, oh, coelacanths lived 65 million years ago. How do you know? Well, that's the last fossil we found of them. And then they find them still alive. What does that prove? For 65 million years, by their thinking, no coelacanths lived or no coelacanths fossilized. Obviously, they would say none, it just happened that none fossilized. Well, it could be that none of the humans fossilized either that were buried uh, or weren't buried deep enough or they haven't been found yet. All kinds of reasons for that. I was in a debate uh, with a former preacher turned atheist one time, the debate over Noah's Ark. One of his arguments was that Noah could not have built the Ark like the Bible says because the Bible says Noah covered the Ark with pitch. And he said, Hoven, don't you know pitch is made from oil? And oil is a post-flood product, according to your theory. The flood buried this world. All these animals got buried and squished and turned to oil. So if oil came as a result of the flood, then how could Noah have pitch to cover the ark? 
Well, that's based on a common misunderstanding. In Genesis 6, it says, Noah covered the ark with pitch, within and without. Make it with pitch, Exodus 2. Noah, or Moses, was put in a little basket covered with pitch. So, what is pitch? The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 34, uh, The streams thereof shall be turned to pitch, the dust to brimstone, and the land to, shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched. The smoke thereof shall go up forever. Pitch, according to the 1828 Webster's Dictionary, which is in the library there, pitch is made from tree sap. There used to be huge industries taking pine trees, baking them down, getting the sap out, and making pitch just for waterproofing ships. Kind of like varnish today, or spar varnish, or uh, uh, linseed oil. There are many oils and things made that don't have to be, rely on something from a flood. It doesn't have to be something that was destroyed in the flood. Pitch, according to the dictionary, the, residue, the resin of pine or turpentine. And there were giant factories all over America producing barrels and barrels of pitch to sell to ships in the 1800s, 1700s, 1800s. It was common. You bring a few extra barrels of pitch with you. If you get a leak in your ship, you, you tar it. So it does not have to be from uh, flood-related deposits. I'm holding in my hand. I don't know if you guys can focus in on that or not. This is a piece of slate or shale, I mean. There are <clears throat> probably 60 layers to it, real thin layers, and you can see oil oozing out the side. But right there on the surface is an exact, it's a fish. It's true that animals under pressure turn to oil. It's a fact. This fish was squeezed between these layers, and it's, you can see the actual impression of the fish. There's no question that at least some of the oil in the ground comes from organisms, living organisms, fish, you know, people, whatever, that are squeezed. But that doesn't mean Noah had to have this kind of oil to waterproof the ark. Right? This is on our Creation Evidence Museum. If you want to come down to Dinosaur Adventure Land, you can take a look at that. Next question. I often get asked the question, is modern man smart and ancient man stupid? You know, was he stupid or was ancient man uh, really smart? There's a good book called The Puzzle of Ancient Man by Don Chittick. Excellent book. I believe they've had a hard time keeping it in print. Uh, we, have a, we sell a lot of them, I know. It's really, really good. Going through all kinds of interesting artifacts that are found about humans, but made by humans, amazing machines and stuff, that would have to be really, really old. Well, the Bible teaches before the flood came, the people lived to be 900 years old. Adam came pre-programmed straight from the hand of God. He could walk, talk, name the animals, and get married first day. He probably knew incredible amounts of information that was pre-programmed in, or after spending a hundred years walking and talking with God, he just knew a lot of stuff that God told him. God would say, Adam, you see this tree right here? Watch this. You pull off the bark, scrape the inside, and chew on that. And, oh, wow. Yeah, it's got vitamins. You need that, Adam. Probably a lot of the ancient medicines, you know, that cultures have are remnants of things left over from knowledge passed down by the ancients. Like, how did the first guy know you can take a willow tree and scrape the bark off and make vitamin C out of the tea? I mean, how do they know that? <laughs> Who's the first guy to start chewing on a tree? I mean, you got to wonder. Somebody must have told them. So, if they're living 900 years and having huge families and learning an incredible amount, I don't know how far advanced they got before the flood came, but I suspect possibly even more advanced than we are today. And some people say, well, why don't we dig up, the, dig up their cities? Well, the problem is we're looking at what things that we need today and assuming that they needed them before the flood. Suppose they lived in a world with perfect weather. You don't need a house. Just go sleep on the grass. Ever, suppose you lived in a world where none of the animals would harm you. All the animals were friendly. Everything's vegetarian, Genesis 1.29. Again, you don't need a house. And why don't we find their cars? Well, man, if you're 9 or 10 or 12 feet tall and can run 50 miles an hour, and you, everything's growing in your yard, you don't need to go anywhere anyway. <laughs> Why do you need a highway system? Why do you need a car? You don't need airplanes. You don't need trains. So if you can think Garden of Eden conditions, the things that they needed would not be the same things that we need. After the flood, the people were still living to be 400 years old. So a lot of this knowledge would be retained. Now today, you know, about the time you know everything, you're 80 years old and you die. <laughs> now you can't pass it on to anybody else. But if you could live to be four or five hundred, you could pass on your knowledge to your great, 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 great grandchild. So it'd just be a real, real different world back then. So a lot of this knowledge, I think, went to the grave. But in the old days, you could go talk to your great, 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 great grandfather and get advice. And he'd give you some really cool advice on how to do certain things. Many civilizations after the flood would arise very quickly. 
If you've got a bunch of smart people, Noah's sons, having, you know, 15, 20 kids per family or whatever, and they're going to go off to this area and they're going to build their own civilization. Well, it wouldn't take them long as long as they've got high IQ. They might not have all the technology. They might have to make stone tools at first, you know, until they can dig a hole to find the iron to melt it down to get, make the steel tools. They would know how to do it. It's kind of a Gilligan's Island situation. But within 50 years, you could build a civilization. You look at Robinson Crusoe, you know, lands on an island. So after 20 years, he's got a whole, <clears throat> got a farm, got a house, got a, a fort, did it all himself, you know. So yeah, it doesn't, especially you get smart people in situations like that, it, you can build a civilization in a hurry. It's interesting, if you study history, all of the ancient civilizations, the Babylonians, the Sumerians, the Greeks, they all, are the Chinese, they just arose out of nowhere. Poof, there's a civilization. There's no evidence of this stuff they teach in school, of them going from hunters and gatherers and grunts and groans, <laughs> you know, caveman stuff, becoming civilized and building cities. There's no evidence of that. It's, the farther back you go, it's all of a sudden, poof, there's the beginning of the Egyptian civilization, the beginning of the Chinese civilization, just like they moved in and built it in less than 100 years. So, some strange things have been found in the fossils, uh, as in the ground, that would indicate man used to be really smart. This little airplane, for instance, is in the Smithsonian, I believe. Right, yeah, in Smithsonian. It was found in a grave in Columbia. <clears throat> it's about a thousand years old. But it's an airplane, quite obviously, with all the features of an airplane. But it can't be an airplane, according to the evolutionist, so therefore they have it labelized in the Smithsonian as a stylized insect. Now tell me, does that look like a stylized insect to you? <laughs> See, they can't admit that ancient man knew about airplanes, because that would go against the theory. The theory says, modern man is smart, ancient man was stupid, he was, you know, a chimpanzee, walking on four most of the time, slowly came up, and here we are today, the gods of the universe. That's the thinking in their mind. Actually, the evidence shows the opposite of that. Here's an airplane, again, found in an Egyptian tomb this time, 2100 years old, pre-Christ. How did they know about airplanes? A little model airplane. They knew about flight. This iron pot, we've got a model of it here, was found inside a lump of coal. This is a replica. You can get a replica from Carl Baugh. They're breaking open a lump of coal and there's an iron pot inside. They examine the coal that comes out and it's molded right to the pot on both sides. I mean, the coal formed around the iron pot. What would you conclude? That a coal miner dropped it? No, because then the coal won't be conformed to the pot. I would conclude that they had iron and were making iron vessels before the flood. During the flood, they got buried in a forest of trees and squished and turned to coal, and of course it's not going to affect the iron any. How do you get an iron pot in a lump of coal? Ancient man must have been smart, not primitive. In Peru, they've got giant stone walls like the one in the picture here. These stone walls are phenomenal. Some of the rocks in there are so huge, we can't even move them today. There's a, more in the Puzzle of Ancient Man about that topic if you want to read more, but uh, there's sto one of the stones down in Peru weighs 20,000 tons. Now to give you an idea how big that is, the largest crane on earth today can lift 3,000 tons. I think they just built one in Japan, uh, if I recall, for unloading ships, I just heard about it in 2003 or 4, that can lift 6,000 tons. Something like that. That may be the new, somebody's going to say, oh, Hovind, you're wrong. It's more, 3,000 is wrong. You're lying. I'm not lying. I just don't know. <laughs> I think it's 6,000 tons now, okay? But still, he's got stones up here that weigh 20,000 tons. How did they move that? Who, who, who did it and how did they do it? I don't think it's logical to say ancient man was primitive. They must have known something we don't know today. Like uh, this guy said, what is truly impossible about the block is that the size of a, it's the size of a five-story house and weighs 20,000 tons. We have no combination of machinery today that could dislodge such a weight, let alone move it. We can't even break it loose from the ground, let alone move it. We can't do it. This bell was found inside a lump of coal in West Virginia. The guy who had it on his desk for years later moved to Central Florida, and I've not been able to, he's an old man now, I've not been able to get a hold of him lately, so if you get his address, let me know. Because I think he needs to have that on display at a creation museum in Pensacola, Florida. That's what I think. This thing was analyzed and they said, well, this is some kind of strange uh, old, uh, like a Buddhist type god on top of here. But how could you find a brass bell inside coal? Ancient man knew how to work with all the metals. The Bible says Tubal-Cain was an artificer in brass and iron. That's Adam's grandson. 
they were already working with brass and iron. This is a little zinc and silver vessel was found inside rock supposed to be 600 million years old. Well, I disagree with the 600 million year part, but they knew about things. There's a great article in the Puzzle of Ancient Man about the uh, little device found in a ship that was su sunk in 100 BC in the Aegean Sea, which is right next to Greece. Okay? It's got an analog computer on board. How on earth did they know about analog computers in 100 BC? It's called the uh, Anti Antikythera device, Antikythera mechanism. The History Channel uh, in March of 2005 was amazing. It had a whole hour-long message about this Antikythera device found in Greece. They actually built a working model of it and said this thing, by turning the crank, would be able to predict where the planets would be or the sun would be. It would be like an amazing computer for ships navigating. 100 BC. No, ancient man was not primitive. You can get copies of this hammer from our uh, museum. This uh, Dr. Baugh has the original in his museum. He lets us make replicas of it. This was found in 1934 in uh, Texas, New London, Texas. When they first found the hammer, the handle was petrified, what was left of it. And they looked at the hammer and said, man, it was in solid rock. I said, what on earth? How can a hammer be in rock? And the rock was supposed to be 400 million years old. So, of course, guys that, who believe in evolution would say, well, that just proves aliens visited the planet 400 million years ago and one of them dropped his hammer. I mean, that's the kind of logic they, they use. Instead of thinking, you know, maybe our whole time scale's wrong, they will never consider that. They cut a little notch in the hammer with a file in 1934 to see what kind of metal it was. It is still not rusted, the notch. It's a type of a stainless steel. Battelle Laboratory analyzed it and said it's 96% iron, 2.6% chlorine, and 3 quarter percent sulfur. And then they said, you know, we don't think you can get those elements to combine unless you do it under a much stronger magnetic field. Probably the pre-flood Earth had a magnetic field 8 or 10 times stronger than what we have today. This was found in Iraq, this a little battery. Quite a few of these were found. They knew about electricity 2,000 years ago. The Egyptians apparently knew about electricity. Here's a hieroglyphic showing snakes in some kind of chamber hooked with a wire going to a little generator of some kind. We don't know. There are two theories. One is they are using electricity to mummify the snake or do something, or they're using electric eels to produce the electricity. I don't know which way the electricity is going, or even if it's electricity. But I think <clears throat> we've got the wrong idea to say Modern man is smart and ancient man was stupid. I think ancient man knew a lot. They knew about brain surgery. Quite a few skulls are found like this. This process is called a trepanning. They would actually cut into somebody's head. And many are found with the hole healed over, which indicates the patient lived. Okay? I mean, cutting a hole in the head is no big deal. But some of the Ica stones from Peru show what appears to be brain surgery. Dr. Dennis Swift that spoke at our boot camp in 2004 has uh, some of the instruments, the co hardened copper instruments that they would use for brain surgery or for surgery period. Okay? Qu ancient man knew how to do all kinds of things with people's heads besides cut them open and let them heal. They did make strange shapes to the heads. They apparently did heart surgery from some of the Ica stones anyway. It appears that they're doing you know, open heart surgery. Here's a guy with an artificial limb attached. So they knew about that. That would have been you know, 2,000 years ago. This little machine appears to be some kind of steam engine. They might have known about some kind of power like that 2,000 years ago. They certainly knew about the wheel. This little cat was found on uh, wheels to move around, a little kid's toy apparently, in some of the Inca Indian tombs. They knew certainly were smart as far as biology goes. This little spider is one of the uh, little nothing, it's 150 feet tall. It's one of the Nazca line images. We cover some of that on uh, video too. But they knew that to make this spider with no eyes, because it's blind, these little spiders are extremely rare. It's only an eighth of an inch long, and it lives in caves, in the dark, in the Amazon, a thousand miles away from where the drawing is. So they really knew about their biology. And they knew to make the one leg longer, and it's the correct leg too. Third leg down on the right, on the right side. That leg, during mating season, for 15 seconds, that one leg grows longer, and it changes DNA off the tip of that leg. And they knew that. So they were not ancient. Uh, not stupid. They were ancient, but they were not stupid. This uh, Pira Reese map of 1513 shows Antarctica with no ice on it. How did they know to, first of all, how did they find Antarctica? How did they know to map it with no ice? 
something was different, okay? This metallic sphere was found in South Africa. It has three parallel grooves around the equator, but it was found in what they said was pre-Cambrian material, 2.8 billion years old. Well, of course, I disagree with the 2.8 billion years. It's a human artifact, quite obviously, found in rock, supposed to be 2.8 billion years old. But see, rather than question, you know, maybe it's not 2 billion years old, guys like Michael Cremo, who wrote the great book on stuff like this, they're called OOPART, Out of Place Artifacts, O-O-P-A-R-T. He, he studies all kinds of these things. Now, he's a Hindu. Michael Cremo has the book Hidden History of the Human Race. He says this proves aliens came and visited the Earth 2.8 billion years ago. Rather than question, hey, wait, maybe the whole geologic column is wrong, they just, I don't know why, they're not allowed to question that. His book's called The Hidden History of the Human Race. It's in our library if you want to read that. Here's a mortar and pestle, you know, to grind wheat or grind flour with, grind corn. The problem is, it's in rock, supposed to be 33 to 55 million years old, way before a man got here. So what do you conclude? Well, again, aliens came, visited the planet. These little uh, spirals were found. The thing that's amazing about these little spirals, they're made of tungsten, very difficult metal to work with, very difficult to refine, and these things are three ten thousandths of an inch, three ten thousandths of a millimeter in diameter. And it follows the perfect golden mean ratio. Same thing used in the Fibonacci sequence, 1 to 1.618. How do they know about that? A lot of these are found in Russia. Pavel, well, if you get over there, get, bring me some of these. I want some of these for the museum. These little amazing little spirals. There's all kinds of stuff on the internet about that if you want to read it. Well, what about the pyramid? Who built the Great Pyramid? If we think an ancient man is, you know, dumb, how did they build the Big Pyramid? There are 66 copies of the original, apparently. There appear to be 67 of these giant stone pyramids found around the world. Who built them and why? Well, there's not much question on the 66 copies, you know, who built them. It was the Egyptians or the, you know, South American Mayan Indians or something. But who built that original one? The original pyramid is often called the Great Pyramid. It is by far the largest of the pyramids, and it's very different in that there are no inscriptions found in it, other than a few marks the builders apparently made, you know, put this rock on top of this one. But all the rest of the pyramids in Egypt have all kinds of hieroglyphics, you know, this is King Herman, the greatest guy that ever lived, blah, blah, blah. Not this one. The greatest pyramid, the biggest building on earth by far, has no inscriptions. Who built it? Why was it built? Well, there are four theories about the Great Pyramid, and they fall into two general categories. One theory says it was built before the flood by some godly people, i.e. Adam, Enoch, maybe, I don't know, and the purpose of it was to preserve some ancient knowledge, because there are some amazing mathematical formulas in the pyramid, like, you know, twice the height divided by the base is the value of pi, 3.14159, I forget. There's all kinds of amazing mathematics in the Great Pyramid. So one theory says it was built by godly people before the flood. Second theory says it's built by heathen before the flood. It's just a heathen structure, some kind of temple worship or something. The third theory says it's built by godly people after the flood. And the fourth one says it's built by heathen after the flood. Probably it was not built during the flood. I think we could probably all agree on that, okay? Not a good time to build a pyramid. I kind of lean toward number one, but I, I don't, wouldn't prove that. I couldn't prove it and wouldn't be dogmatic about it. I think some godly people, probably Enoch, built this pyramid to preserve the gospel story. One of the theories on all this is, of course, Adam, Adam did not have a Bible. So God gave him the gospel story in the stars. This is what many people think, and I kind of lean that way, though I'm, I'm willing to discuss it. Noah did not have a Bible. And if the canopy was gone that used to protect him and probably amplified the light so they could see the stars better before the flood, you know, 20 inches or 30 inches of ice, compacted, super frozen, like we talked about on video two, that canopy before the flood would have actually made it easier to see the stars and they could actually hear the music of the stars, the zodiac, that's one of the theories. But Noah didn't have a Bible. He had a couple chapters because Adam actually wrote part of Genesis. Okay, we cover that in the teledose coming up here soon. But So God gave them the gospel in stone. This is how the, it preaches good, whether it's true or not, I don't know. But basically, there used to be the gospel in stars, then there was the gospel in stone, and today we have the gospel in scripture. The three different ways. Now, I, let's assume that there may be some truth to that and go from there. If there isn't, it's not a big deal. I won't lose any sleep over it. But the Great Pyramid is an amazing structure. 
by far the largest building on the planet today. Still, largest building in the world, uh, built bigger than anything ever built by man since. Some people think the Isaiah 1919 19 passage is referring to the pyramid. It says, In that day there shall be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a border, a pillar at the border thereof. And it shall be for a sign and a witness. There are quite a few folks who think that the pyramid is this, this is it. Because that there's, their teaching goes that Egypt split into two kingdoms, northern and southern kingdom, and they were fighting in you know, civil war kind of stuff, and this pyramid is right on the border. And then when they united, it's now in the midst thereof. So it is both at the border and in the midst. Otherwise, how could a building be that way? Now, of course, the Jehovah's Witnesses have gone crazy with the pyramid. There are all kinds of books by Jehovah's Witnesses thinking, oh, this prophesies everything and proves Jehovah's Witnesses are right, you know. And they, they kind of take it to real wild extremes. And there are many books available on the pyramid, some of which are absolutely loony. But it's very interesting reading. The pyramid is a huge building. The, it goes up four sides to the, stop, to the top, and the top stone was never installed. If you look at the diagram here, there's only one door into the pyramid. Nobody could find the door until 800 A.D. That pyramid sat there for thousands of years, and nobody could find their way in. Finally, in 800 A.D., some Arabs got a hammer and chisel and just started pounding a hole, chiseled their way into the pyramid. They chiseled and chiseled and for months, and the guy kept telling his workers, oh, there's going to be lots of gold in here, you're all going to be rich, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, finally, after months and months of chiseling, everybody's getting tired of going in, you know, digging a hole in the rock, okay, because it was solid rock. Finally, they were close to giving up, and they heard a noise of a rock falling. And he said, oh, it came from over that way. Let's chisel there. They chiseled over, and they hit one of the passages in the middle, and then had to work their way backwards to find the door. Had they known where it was, they could have walked up and just pushed it right open. But nobody could find this door for centuries. Well, once they found the pyramid and mapped it out, you see it's got an entrance where the A is. The entrance, only one entrance in, it immediately takes you on the broad road down to the pit, letter C. Or you can take a choice to make a turn and go up uh, channel E there, up the narrow road that goes to the king's chamber. So your choice is the broad way that leads to the pit or the narrow way that leads to the king's chamber. Now that'll preach. It sounds like there's a little gospel in there somewhere, right? If you get to the king's chamber, you find yourself in an empty tomb where nobody ever rotted, no bodies de decomposed in there, and it's on the 50th row of stones. What's that all mean? I don't know. There's a grand gallery that some people think has marks along the way that in those marks, if they go by pyramid inches, which is a little bigger than our inch, the pyramid inch, they say you, each one marks a year, and they, they say on this grand gallery that it's got marked off where World War I is, World War II, major events through world history are supposedly marked off in the grand gallery. That's some of the stuff you read in these books when you read about the pyramid. It's the largest building by far. It contains enough stone to build a 10-foot high brick wall all the way around Texas or France. They're about the same size. 10-foot high brick wall around Texas. The top of the pyramid is 455 feet high. The, the 50th row of stones, which is interesting, the 50th year of Jubilee, the 50th row of stones is where the king's chamber is. And those who teach that the pyramid has Christian symbolism, of course, will jump on this type of thing. The broad way, the narrow way, you know, the king's chamber, etc. Um, or you go down to the pit. In the king's chamber is an empty tomb. I was told, I didn't check it out, maybe, I'm not, maybe it's not correct, but it has the same volume, this empty tomb, as the Ark of the Covenant. You take the length times the width times the height, it equals the volume of the Ark of the Covenant. Maybe somebody can check it out, let me know if that's correct. But originally, the pyramid was covered by 144,000 smooth, polished casing stones. Each one weighed about, I believe they said 10 tons were the casing stones. They fit together so tightly, in many cases you couldn't even find the seam. And in all cases, I was told, you can't even get a piece of paper between them. These, imagine a 10-ton stone fitting together with the next one so tightly you can't even get paper between it. No mortar. I mean, today we build brick walls and put mortar in there, and you can look at the brick on the house here, and some of them are straight and some of them are not too straight. You know, the brick layers get in a little bit of a hurry. These stones are massive, and they didn't even use mortar, and they fit together flawlessly. And the top stone was never in installed. And those who teach it's a Christian building or Christian principles in there say 144,000, uh huh, Revelation chapter 7. 144,000. The Bible talks about the whole body fitly joined together. And they'll say, see, this is evidence that it's a 
has some Christian symbolism. And maybe it does. I don't know. Right? Ephesians chapter 4, the whole body fitly joined together. Matthew 21 talks about the stone that the builders rejected. Now, the Great Pyramid never did have a chief cornerstone. Imagine the largest, neatest building on the planet, no cornerstone. Why would they stop one rock short? Why didn't they finish the job? Well, I don't know. There are a couple of theories about that. But in Mark 12, it talks about the scripture. Scripture says, the stone that the builders rejected. Luke 20, the stone that the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is obviously referring to Jesus Christ. In Daniel, it tells about the stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands and smote the image on the feet in the book of Daniel. Could this stone be Jesus Christ, who's going to make his own kingdom on the world? Revelation 21 talks about the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. There are those who teach that the New Jerusalem, the city, and the Bible tells us the great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven, will be clear as crystal, four square, and 12,000 furlongs. That's 1,379 miles. So there's going to be a city in Revelation 21 that is 1,300 or 1,400 miles by 1,400 miles by 1,400 miles. And everybody assumes it's going to be a cube. Maybe so. I don't know. But maybe it's a pyramid because that's a structure that could also have those dimensions, and it would lie four square. And if it's a pyramid, pyramids only have one cornerstone right on top, whereas other buildings would have four. So there are those who teach that the Great Pyramid is going, the, the New Jerusalem is going to be in the shape of a Great Pyramid, and Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone, and He is the light of the world. And if the whole thing's clear as crystal, then the light just kind of translucent, uh, translucent, the light goes right through. So he is the light thereof. The first uh, 13 verses in the Bible starts off with this, the world has light, but it has no sun. The last 26 verses of the Bible, the world has light, but it has no sun. He is the light thereof. And so maybe the pyramid is symbolic of that. I don't know. Hutchins got a good book on that if you want to read it. And of course, if the, any of this is true, it's obvious Satan would use this as a, you know, pervert it for his use. And the great pyramid on the back of your dollar bill is a Masonic Lodge symbol which has 13 rows of stones representing the 13 degrees in the Blue Lodge. The chief cornerstone is not yet in place, and many people say this represents Lucifer, and he's going to come down and establish his kingdom, when actually, you know, God's going to establish his kingdom toward the end. But which one's right? I don't know. I kind of lead toward number one, but I wouldn't be dogmatic. The Bible isn't clear. Next question. <clears throat> the textbooks often teach the earth was a hot, molten mass. This earth science book says, As the earth formed, it was hot, and there were large pools of bubbling lava. Well, now the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 that the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So, was the earth a hot molten mass and it slowly cooled down over billions of years, or was it created under water, which means, of course, it has to be less than 212 degrees. It's not a hot molten mass. Somebody's wrong. 